everyone. Welcome to Sifted's Game of the Year Awards for 2019. I'm Shane Satterfield. I'm Matt Kyle. And we are about to pick 24 different categories for the very best in video games from the past 12 months. Um, no, we did add a couple categories back this year. Uh, we brought back fighting and driving, although well, one, of, one of us brought back one of those. Yeah. <laughs> He has 24 categories. I have 23. 23. Yeah, Matt decided not to make a pick for one of the categories this year, and I totally get it. Um, before we get into sort of going award by award, what do you think is kind of the the theme of 2019, now that we sort of have it in our rearview mirror? Um, hmm. The theme kind of seems to be... What do you like? Yeah, <laughs> it like, was not an amazing year for no, games. It's not an it's not a year for like objective like wow like that game whoa like Heads it's and more shoulders, like above hey, the rest. this yeah. is my kind of thing I like this yeah not everyone's gonna like this you know like hell the most high profile AAA game is like the d- definition of that that's stranding yeah. is like some, some people gonna some, like some it. people gonna dig it some people gonna think it's the most boring thing they played all year yeah. Three guesses which category I fall. It was not the most boring thing I played all year. Actually. No, me either. Yeah, me either. But it was close. <laughs> it was close it, for me. <laughs> it got saved. That's a category got, we should add. Yeah. Most boring game. <laughs> it got saved from winning that by um, some sailors. Let's yeah, say. yeah <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so again, we do have 24 different awards. We have about two hours to get through them all. So we really got to kind of get jumping on them. We're gonna kick things off with. Let me get my rundown here. Best. First person shooter. Was there some fantasy league thing you wanted to do? No. We no. covered that last show. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that already. So we're going to dive into best first person shooter of 2019. A lot of our awards, uh, Matt and I are just picking a winner. And then there is about a handful of categories where Matt and I will choose a runner up and a winner. But generally, those are towards the end. They're the mm-hmm. bigger categories. So for the first, man, I think like 15 awards, we're just picking a winner. Matt, you can feel free to toss in, you know, mention another game if you want to, mm-hmm. but we're not officially Honestly, this was a pretty runners. hard set of picks. It was. Like, <laughs> not to, like, decide between games, but to, like, pick a game. I had to work hard on these. Especially for this first category. The first yeah, time, yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, did I like any of these? Yeah. Like, honestly, this is probably Gears 5, but Gears 5 is not a first-person shooter. Yeah. So, yep. <laughs> here we are. Here we are. Um, and I don't think anyone's going to guess what either of our picks no. are. No. We, we, we went backwards on this one. We did. Yep. Matt, so what is your pick for the best first-person shooter of 2019? My pick is Apex Legends. And that doesn't surprise me because it's it's also one of just a couple shooters that you played this year, right? Yeah, I didn't play. I mean, I played the big ones. I played... Uh, um, Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare, and I played uh, Borderlands. I mean, it was. I guess that's also an RPG. But yeah, like, that's a shooter. I played Metro Exodus. I played uh, the big stuff. Um, but uh, of... Even as someone who's not a multiplayer guy, like there's just something about how this game feels, which is probably that respawn. Oh yeah, Titanfall Absolutely. touch. Absolutely, yep. Um, that I liked playing. It's the, the only battle royale game I really stuck for any with for any length of time. Which granted was only like a month. Yep. on and off. <laughs> that's still that's but the like, longest you've done it. But it was. It's just. It's the only one that I think is fun to play moment to moment and feels good to play and isn't just sort of like putting up with janky weirdness for the sake of like something you enjoy. Um, and especially because it was like such an out of nowhere surprise, like I thought it was really good. And so, uh, in a in a year that I think was pretty light on the ground for decent shoot first person shooters, uh, Apex Legends gets my pick. Okay, and this is as you guys know, if you followed me for years a- across my career, you know, first person shooters are a big part of my gaming diet. Mm-hmm. I play a lot of shooters. I tend to play Call of Duty a lot. Like I have kind of stuck with Modern Warfare um, multiplayer. Uh, they've done a pretty good job of putting out yeah. regular updates for that. I ended up deleting it because it got to 150 gigabytes, and I'm like, oh, you know what? No. No, I <laughs> don't. It was a patch, 12 gigabytes. Yeah. The next day, another 12 gigabyte patch. It's mm-hmm. 150 gigs. It's, it's been on the market for like a month. It's insane. So it is not my pick for best first-person shooter of 2019. That honor goes to Metro Exodus. Um, I think what happened to me is I, I started looking back across the shooters this year, and they all just kind of blurred together. And look, I yep. do respect Apex Legends. Um, I, I get the perspective that you're coming from. It, it does feel really great, and it's a free-to-play, triple-A, you know, battle royale shooter. Impressed by it. 
But I was more impressed by Metro Exodus. Um, the single player campaign, the multiplayer, obviously non-existent, which is, you know, typically I I weight multiplayer pretty heavily with this award. Mm-hmm. But this year, the multiplayer in all these games was just so samey that I couldn't find that any shooter had a leg up on another shooter. So I decided to to just look at which shooter did I have the most fun playing, and that was Metro Exodus. It was the moodiest. It was the most different shooter on the market, just kind of the, the tempo that the game played at. Um, the setting was completely different from anything else. It wasn't some military thing. It wasn't some like mm. goofy, like sci-fi, far-flung, intergalactic shooter. Um, it had its own tone. It had its own to- it had its own timbre. I just, to me, this shooter stood out the most in 2019, and it is not a complete game. It doesn't have multiplayer. And I would argue that the post-launch support for this hasn't been great. Um, but again, just thinking back across the year, uh, it was the one that stuck with me the most. And I would say probably, I know this won't be a popular opinion, but probably the second game on that list for me would be Rage 2. Hmm. I know that game got... I keep kinda, forgetting about Rage It kind of got murdered by critics, and it didn't show up really at all mm-hmm. at the Game Awards, but I had a ton of fun playing Rage 2. I had a blast with it. So. My favorite... Uh, actually, my, the best time I had playing a first-person shooter this year doesn't count because it wasn't... It was a re- remaster. Oh. Uh, Halo Reach. Yeah. I played that. It, it feels old. It does, <laughs> but, but I will say it looks good. Like it, it does, it doesn't, yeah. It, it, I think it made the the transition to the Xbox One the best of all the Halo games yeah. that were remasters. Like, it looks, I mean, it's obviously the newest of those, but, like, it looks the most like it wasn't a remaster. Yep. Yeah, like, it, 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 the art style translates the best to a higher resolution, I think. Yep. But, it, it was just a straight port, so it doesn't really matter. It, really it matter. plays like an old game. Like you get, it's funny. Like if you play a lot of shooters, it's kind of hard to see how they're evolving and changing if you keep playing every single one. But when you go back and just play this game from ten years ago, that's when you kind of really notice. Wow, okay, this genre actually has evolved a good bit over the last decade. So there mm-hmm. you go. There are our picks for best first-person shooter of 2019. Next up, a category that a lot of times ties into the prior category, and that is Best Multiplayer Game. Now, the title of this award is open-ended for a reason, because that can encapsulate a lot of things. It can be PvE, PvP, it can be asymmetrical. Anything that gets multiple people involved in the same video game falls into this category. Matt, what was your pick? Um, for this, I pretty much went with uh, the kind of the thing I played the most multiplayer, and that was Ace Combat 7. Wow. Um, I but, honestly didn't dive into the multiplayer too much after launch. How did it end up kind of shaking out? I mean, it's pretty much standard dogfighting stuff. Uh, I'm just really good at it. <laughs> so, like, I played it more than probably... I normally would. Um, I've said that many times. That You'd be shocked how many people who play video games f- as much as these people do do not know how to do a split S. Oh. <laughs> um, but I'm an old, like, plain, you know, space dog fighting nerd, so, like, yeah. I can do, I can get my hand, my head around it pretty well. And uh, the, I mean, surprisingly strong connections in this. The, the gameplay modes are not very diverse. Like, it's basically dog fighting, or, like, you can do, like, a co-op thing to attack, you know, like a, like a, Flying Fortress. There were like missions for that. Um, very so it's pretty basic. But like, how many multiplayer arcade f- jet fighter games exist these days? Almost none. like one. Yeah, pretty much this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, early, you know, came out like January, I think, or early, early yeah, in the year. Really early in the year. But uh, I played this for a good chunk of January and February. So uh, I'm not going to tell anyone who isn't a huge plane nerd to go play this um, because it's not particularly compelling if you're not like that's it's literally interesting to me because of what it is and how little competition it has Um, but like yeah this was the thing I I spent the most time on okay my pick for best multiplayer game again no it's not Call of Duty Modern Warfare Uh, (laughs) people always assume I'm going to give every award to Call of Duty for like because I like mm-hmm. liked the original like Modern Warfare is like 13 years ago or whatever, not the case this year. Um, and this I think this is going to surprise some people. My pick for best multiplayer game is Death Stranding. 
Um, to me, again, you know, when I was talking about first-person shooters, and I looked back across all the games that came out this year, they were all very samey. Or you look at games like The Division 2, which, again, is just kind of this template that's just repeated over and over in this loot shooter subgenre. This, to me, was the most creative, interesting, and functional multiplayer impl- implementation in gaming in 2019. Um, so basically the opposite of my choice. <laughs> yeah, I guess like, it is kind of. But you went for full innovation, and I went for, like, totally basic, does the job. Yeah, but you yeah. had fun with it. Yeah. And I think, again, that's kind I of... I do a, check in once in a while to make sure my roads are still up. I mean, think about that, though. Like, just... And even just the, the Dark Souls concept, where you're leaving kind of traces for people. And it's also been interesting to see how people troll with that stuff mm-hmm. and leave kind of traps and things like that. Like, it just... It makes me think about the game in very interesting and different ways from how I think about really any other video game as far as connectivity and multiplayer is concerned. Um, I don't like a lot about Death Stranding, Mm -hmm. but the one thing I love a whole lot is the connectivity and how the multiplayer works in it. Um, It was funny to see Norman Reedus at the Game Awards and think, like, I've spent so much time making (laughs) you pee. (laughs) Yeah, he he gave out, what, Best Action Game, I think it was? Something like that, yeah. yeah. I guess he couldn't give out, like, the Best Director Award. No, or Best, like, Voice Actor. Or, or whatever it else it won, yeah. that was, I mean, that went to Matt. <laughs> I mean, you could have. Who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, they do that usually uh, at the Oscars. Last year's winner is usually the one that gives it out. Yeah. For the acting stuff. Yeah. And, look, I don't like Death Stranding, but I can recognize that there are parts of it that are very, very good. And this is I mean, this, this element of it is certainly, the to me, the only compelling aspect of the game. Yeah. Like, this is the only thing that made me interested and kept me playing. I mean, it is. It, that's it's kind of the whole concept of the game. Like, yeah. If you if you've listened to that kind of the syn- strand game. Yeah, thing, that sy- yeah. symposium that uh, that Kojima gave about like the strands and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of thought that have, yeah. has gone into. I it. mean, it's the usual. I mean, it's his usual bullshit about. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like you came up with a weird word for a thing that everybody, a lot of other things have already done, like transferring. Yeah. It's like that's yeah, right. I forgot you, about that. You just moved your save <laughs> over, dude. Like that's not a revolutionary tech. <laughs> like asymmetrical multiplayer, like you know, uh, you know, a asynchronous multiplayer has been a thing in mobile games forever, but like. Yeah, like the implementation of that was is interesting and it's good. It's tied into and, everything too, which makes a difference. Yeah, and it's like it, you know it affects how you play moment to moment. So sure. Yep. All right, let's move along. Next up is best adventure game. Uh, people, I think, get confused by this sometimes because there are some websites are a little loose in how they define adventure game. Adventure game for us is like a first person walking simulator, a point and click adventure game. Any game where the primary thing you're doing is adventuring and looking for stuff. Or like kind of more story driven. Story driven. Yeah. Less less Twitch focused and more. Generally no combat. Yeah. Or if there is combat, it's usually like. Predetermined. Predetermined or more thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we're looking at for best adventure game of 2019. Could Matt, Telltale make it? That's really right. Kind of yeah, funny. that's a good way to put it. Actually, would you think that this was a Telltale game? Yeah, that's adventure games. Yeah. If we put this in a terrible 3D engine, would you <laughs> believe this was a Telltale game? There's your, there's your litmus test. <laughs> okay, Matt. So what's your pick for best adventure game? Uh, mine is After Party. Yeah, I wasn't surprised by this one. Um, this is uh, definitely because it was my pick at first. Mm-hmm. This is definitely my shit. Uh, I love, like, weird sardonic takes on the afterlife. Um, Weird depictions of, like, pop culture sensibility-infused versions of hell are one of my favorite things. Um, And one of, uh, basically, one of fiction's favorite things, going all the way back to Dante's Inferno, which was basically a uh, political diatribe disguised as religious fan fiction. Yeah. Um, And, like, this is is exceptionally well-written. It's very well-performed. It has... uh, I think it has the best voice acting and writing of the year. I think that's probably true. Uh, Ashley Ashley Birch is great in um, as Parvati in uh, Outer Worlds, but I think she's better as the demon cab driver in this. Agree. Um, I agree, yep. And you can actually see one of the, one of my favorite. Th- here's the, I will buy games she is in because she's in them. Yeah. And um, one of the early on, uh, also the the main girl in this is uh, Janina Gar Garofalo. Gar- no, not Janina Garofalo. It's Janina Garvanka. She played the the main character in Battlefront Two. Um, the female character. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the Imperial pilot. Yeah. Um, I wish I can't, can never remember her last name. I've met her twice and I can't remember her damn last name. But she's the the main girl in this. And then um, it's just an amazing cast. 
And early on, I think you see one of my favorite things about what Ashley Birch does when she's playing the car- the taxi drive driver early on. Birch can she can talk quietly under her breath, but still make you understand enunci- her enunciation of yeah. every word, and it comes across. She as actually does unforced. that when you talk to her. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> I mean, it's a skill. It's not really a skill you can learn so much as something you learn by being very anxious all the time. Yeah, and she uses it in her performance in a way that almost no other actor work voice actor working today does, and it's incredibly effective. She used to do it on Hey Ash, what you playing too? Yeah, yeah, and uh, so she's great, but also just the general. You know the premise is is fantastic. Everything's very. It's one of the funniest games of the, of the last several years. Like they fully executed the concept. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she is Janina Gav- Gavankar. That's her. Perfect time. She's great too, and uh, and it's it's. If you haven't played it, you should. It is on Game Pass. If you yeah. have it, just just download it. And Someone play just the said damn in thing. the chat that uh, Untitled Goose Game just went on Game Pass today. Oh, that's great too. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, I know that's kind of the thing that everybody wants to pick as their their uh, adventure game this year, but I'm going to go with uh, After Party just because uh, it 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 plucked the right string for me. Okay, so After Party was my pick, um, leading up to my deliberations. But in the last couple of weeks, when there hasn't been a ton of other games to play, I have been going back and kind of picking up indie games. I went back. I played Disco Elysium. Uh, and a couple others. One of the other games that I played that made a huge Im- impact on me was Outer Wilds. Have you played this, Matt? Yeah. I That was the game that um, I actually had pre-ordered somehow, and I didn't know why. And eventually I looked up, because the day it came out, it, it, I had it. I'm like, yeah. oh, I already have this? I don't, yeah. <laughs> it turned out a year before I had put a code in for it, like... That June, so I must have gotten a code from someone at E3. Interesting. And put it in, I forgot about it, but yeah, I, I didn't even know. And I played it for, I did play it for a while. Um, I appreciate what it is, but what it is mostly annoys the hell out of me. In the same way that like Majora's Mask annoys me with the weird time limit, you got to get the oh, you didn't do one thing right, you got to do the whole thing over again. But I do think Outer Wilds is an amazing like clockwork contraption of a game. It's a, it's incredible. Yeah. So to explain it for you guys who maybe haven't played it, it the game plays in 22 minute intervals mm-hmm. and you are you're basically on this planet trying to discover other planets but you only have 22 minutes to get to another planet land and do and, whatever you're going to do and do whatever you're going to do because the sun explodes yeah the the universe explodes yeah. ultimately and the idea is you do it over and over again and your character remembers doing yeah, it because it saves like yeah. everything that you accomplish actually saves yeah. to like your logs and whatnot and everything happens Unless you interfere with it, everything happens the same way every time, but, except you, what you've changed. So you have to kind of like, it basically you have to figure out a, a solar system sized puzzle to figure out why this is happening and stop it. It literally almost melted my brain. It's really impressive. I was, I couldn't believe that this game had slipped through the cracks for me. And that like nobody that I knew had kind of brought it up and been like, hey, this is some game that everyone should kind of check out. Um, yeah, again, After Party was my pick. And then after I play this, it supplanted it for me because it's just, mm-hmm. it's hard to think of many games like it. Yeah. Like you listed off Majora's there is, Mask, there isn't obviously. There really a game like it. I mean, Majora's Mask is the closest comparison, I think, because of the nature of the concept. The time. And like yeah. the, the timing and the fact that everything happens in, 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 independent of you. Yeah. And your job is basically to interfere with the workings of the world in a timely manner. And they're also like intertwined. So there's yeah. like dominoes that topple yes. later on based upon what you do. So I was really, really impressed with this game. Like I kid, this is one of those games where I, I play it and I'm like, I could not imagine making this game. I couldn't imagine designing it. I couldn't imagine then trying to execute the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the best inter- interactive entertainment to me. That's what it does. It's something that you feel like you can never make. So Excellent work, man. I'm glad I got onto this before uh, the Game of the Year Awards so that I could recognize it. Uh, really, really good game. I highly recommend checking it out. Yeah. First time I took off, I ran it. I instant I got out of the atmosphere. I hit a rock and died. Yeah. It <laughs> happens like that, though. Yeah. Yep. S- sometimes it be like that. Yeah, that's the way it is. Uh, next up, best role-playing game, best RPG. This is the first category that we agree, and we have the same winner, mm-hmm. and that winner is... Disco Elysium. Elysium. And I am so glad that I went back and played this game. Um, I knew I was gonna, because mm. anytime you recommend a game that wholeheartedly, I play it. That's just the way it is. I respect your opinion that much that if you tell me I need to play something, I play it. So knowing the Game of the Year awards were coming up, I went back and started going at it. I wish I've had more time mm-hmm. to play it, because I can see 
based upon the amount of time I've spent with it that I am just I don't even know if I've scratched the surface to be yeah, honest with it's, you. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It, and there there's also an element of outer wilds to it because it is. how what time and how long it takes you to do things yep. tie in and you can miss stuff and yeah. you can you know yeah, it's you can change things permanently like it's a it, the timeline matters on this game. I can see why this game hasn't taken off to be like this smash hit. Like I, I'm not surprised mm-hmm. that we're not getting like reports of has sold three million copies or anything like that because I think when you look at it, it's not a particularly inviting game. A lot of the characters are ugly. The color palette's kind of drab, but once you start playing it, I feel like that those elements yeah. are what actually make the game great. Yeah, it's it's. It's the despair of it all. Yeah. That, like the look creates and like how it, it it feels like a scrappy underdog of a game yeah. telling a scrappy underdog of, of a, a tale. story. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the best descriptions of it was from uh, another developer, another another indie, another indie developer. His name I can't remember, but he's on Twitter during after it won something on the Game Awards, and he basically tweeted, uh, "I only played about thirty minutes of Disco Elysium because." After playing for about 15 minutes, I started getting very angry and jealous that I didn't make it, Uh-oh. so I had to stop. <laughs> and I'm like, it is that kind of game. You're like, oh my god, like ha- this is so good. Like, There's some genius stuff. It's so yeah. good, you wish you were part of it. Yeah, somehow. yeah, part of the project. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. like it's 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 like nothing else except maybe Planescape Torment or like some of the the all time great like. A- but this doesn't feel RPGs. old and dusty no. like Planescape Torment. This no. is but I mean it those w- concepts. It, it will in twenty years. Sure, sure. But like every game will. But but this is the closest comparison I have is something like Planescape, where it's all done through dialogue. It's it's skill check based, but it's entirely up to how you want to play it. You can be utterly different characters from playthrough to playthrough because you can pick certain dialogue choices that make your character believe certain things, which changes the nature of your dialogue options. Like you can make your character like a hardline communist, or you can make him like a hardline capitalist or yeah. like someone who believes that you know, imperialism should rule or like there's like you make him into a monarchist. Like it's, and it's all tied directly into the actual political and economic situations of the world they're in, but it's all commentating on our world and it's brilliant. If there's one thing I hope to accomplish from our Game of the Year awards this year, it's to convince some people to give this yeah. game a shot. And may, and it'll I think it'll be on consoles next year, so yeah. it'll be a wider audience for it then. Um, also, like if you watch if you didn't play the if you watch the Game Awards and you came away wondering why the people who made this game thanked Marx and Engels and their th- and, and like you haven't played this yep. game, <laughs> like, you gave away that you didn't play Disco Elysium. If you're like, why do they thank Marx and Engels? It's like yeah. play Disco Elysium. Yep. It's there. You'll find it. Like right. it's a it's a it's a it's a seventies cop show that's also a cyberpunk like dystopia, but it's also like a civics book. Well, the it's other amazing. thing about it is, what does that lower third say? Yeah. Role yeah. playing. This is a pure role playing game. Yeah, it is the truest realization of that genre term. Absolutely, in a very long time. Yep. All right, let's move on. Next is best indie game. This is always a tough category every year. Um, and then, you, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of inconsistencies with awards. This is kind of one where I think both of us kind of, well, maybe not. Maybe it's a little inconsistent. Hmm? Well. In the sense of. Maybe our, for me. Our best RPG you. should have been yeah. this. Yeah. Sort of. But you can't double up that much. Yep. So anyway, best indie game. What's your pick, Matt? Uh, I went with Rebel Galaxy Outlaw. I, I'm not surprised. Um, in part because there's just nowhere else to put it. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to give it something. Like you, I got. I probably could have been fine with giving this to Disco Elysium as well. Yeah. But Disco Elysium got best RPG, so this gets indie game because it's the only place I could put it. Yeah. I almost tried to put it in first person shooter. <laughs> just you try to go, slide one tell by you me. To go fuck yourself because it's because <laughs> it's all in first person. <laughs> but um, and you are shooting things. Yeah. But I decided not to not to have that fight and uh so i just put it here this is uh the closest and most true successor to the old wing commander games that i think has ever been made um it is not an open world simulator like elite dangerous or what star citizen purports to one day be it is a action driven trading shooting space fighter game in which you are uh just it jumps you to the action you hit autopilot to jump to the next thing that's going to happen like there's not like tons of, of transit and all that it's it's very western set in space 
as you can just see from this. Like, she, yeah. you're, you're basically playing a woman who is pretty much a smuggler gunslinger, um, the aunt of the of the person you played in the first game, Rebel Galaxy. Uh, this is a prequel. And you basically, uh, you are in serious debt and trouble, and there's prices on your head, and you get a cheapo, terrible ship from, like, a guy who owes you a favor, and you have to build yourself back up to, uh, you know, ostensibly to kind of, you know, be the best in the in the quadrant, but also just to save your own ass, because they're going to come back after you, and you better be ready for that. Um, this game is right in your wheelhouse. Yep. This is exactly <laughs> the kind of thing I wish was made more often. Um, it isn't much. This is made by just like a tiny little company of, of dudes and and maybe dudettes. I don't know the, the full the full lineup, but it's just a very small company in Texas. Um, the soundtrack is like this crazy rock like country stuff that like I don't really have a descriptor for. I've never heard music like it before, but I like it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I dig it. Like if you don't, I mean, it is an Epic Game Store exclusive, but it is coming to uh, PS4 and I think Switch next year. So hopefully more people get to play it then. Right on. My pick for best indie game, and I do think I have a little bit of a conflict of interest here maybe. Uh, my pick is Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. This was almost my pick too. Now some people may say that it is an action RPG. It's kind of right on the border. It's, I mean, it's a Metroidvania, which is like an action adventure, action RPG. I mean, it's, but it has go either way. Some pretty heavy RPG elements in it, but... Mm. <clears throat> But a lot of people would say, it's Castlevania. It's, it can't be an RPG. And that's what I told myself, to, to give best RPG to Disco Elysium and then give best indie to Bloodstained. Uh, this is Iga, you're seeing right now on the screen, the uh, godfather of Castlevania. This is his new indie take on Castlevania. Uh, I doubt he'll ever work on Castlevania again, so this is all we're going to get. But the good news is, it's amazing. I don't know if I have ever played an indie game as long as I played this one. It took me over 20 hours to finish the game. Most indie games I play, I'm done with like in two or three hours. Um, You could have absolutely sold this game, I believe, as a full price game. I don't think anyone who actually bought it and played it would have regretted the purchase. Um, We can't get Castlevania anymore from Konami, but if this is what we're going to get going forward, I don't, I won't miss Castlevania. All it is is a logo at that point. No, it's plenty good enough. No, it's, it's, it's it's better than half the Castlevania. Yeah, easily for sure. Um, and again, it was so long, and the character progression and development is great. It, the the Metroidvania level design is incredible, yeah, and it's, you can see a bunch of like elements that like clearly are things he's wanted to do for a long time, but Konami wouldn't let them. Put yeah, in the game. wouldn't like, let him, or maybe it just didn't fit within the yeah, construct. But of this was like everything in the, everything in the stew pot. Yeah, including stew. Like yeah, you yeah. can make you can make stew in yeah, this game can. too. <laughs> um, it's uh, it, it feels like he just held nothing back on this game yeah and it's it's very it's a lot of fun and it feels like the old games it feels like the best of the the egovanias but um i i didn't miss the castlevania branding at all me either i don't miss castlevania now because we have this franchise and hopefully it's sold well enough that they can make more and they don't have to keep sort of crowdfunding yeah. them going forward. i would i mean also i would crowdfund another one if they wanted if to they do it to. that way too i yeah. mean which i i wouldn't say about everything i've crowdfunded but i would be back in on this again i think most people would not say that about almost everything they've crowdfunded <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of crowdfunding horror stories out there um but this is definitely not one of them in fact this is one of the best kickstarter stories out there um it took him a while. It was delayed a couple yeah. times, but the wait was definitely worth it. Yeah, this was not another Mighty Number no. 9. Nope, absolutely not. This is the type of game that restores faith in crowdfunding yep. and Kickstarter. So kudos to Iga. He has earned his leather cowboy hat he, once again. He, he absolutely has. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is my best indie game of 2019. Next up, best VR game. Uh, I did not play a ton of VR this no, year. I, I'm just going to be honest right here. I've only played... Like five VR games this year. I think I played two. My original pick for this was Beat Saber because I didn't play Beat Saber last year when mm-hmm. it came out. I got it when it came out on PlayStation 4. And it actually even came out on PlayStation 4 last November. I just didn't give it a go until I was trying to figure out a way to play video games to get in shape. Mm-hmm. And I was like, everyone says Beat Saber, but the, the PlayStation VR version of Beat Saber is not great. Um, so, and then I play, I just recently played the Doctor Who VR experience. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. I played Vader Immortal. That was okay. It's kind of like a Star Wars fans, like VR wet dream. 
Um, but it's very non-interactive for the most part. Have you played yeah, it? I played the first episode of it. It's yeah. just like it, it's like, it's like a carnival ride kind of. Yeah, it's like the void stuff. It's just like yeah. you sort of go through. There's a little bit of action scene, and then you walk through some more stuff, and that's it. Like, um, and so ultimately, I not my award. I would just admit is not as well as informed as it should be. Yeah, I'll although I would it. argue that like there's not a lot of stuff that you needed to play in VR yeah. this year. It was it was not not a great year. It was but yet and yet it seems to have turned the corner. Mm-hmm. So Quest is sold out. Sold out so much that retailers are starting to jack up the price of Oculus Quest. Index is on back order. It seems to be finally the momentum is happening. It, to me it just wasn't a great year for software. Uh, so what's your pick for best, best VR game, Matt? My pick was Ace Combat 7. Okay. <laughs> Possibly the only award show in the industry giving Ace Combat 7 two awards. Two awards. <laughs> Slap that on the box, Namco. Um, but this game has three VR missions in it, uh, exclusive to PlayStation VR, and uh, I wish it had double or triple that, but what there, what is there is fantastic, and it's uh, really well done playing combat, and... The difference between you know playing like normally and being able to look around and spot spot enemy fighters like up difference. above your canopy and then and then like pulling your your plane around to like face the direction your eyes are facing and lining that all up it's really really feels good and it's a lot of fun and I, I the only thing all I over myself. the only thing I went back to <laughs> routinely in VR this year was this game okay um I'll, I'll just be perfectly honest with you my pick for best VR game of 2019 comes from me playing it at E3. Mm-hmm. I did. I don't even have a headset that can play this game, but I played it at E3, and it blew my mind, and that game is called Asgard's Wrath. It I is, have heard very good things. It is an action RPG for VR, but honestly, like they should release this in 2D because it's just a great action RPG on its own, obviously steeped in Norse mythology. It is a first-person action RPG like Skyrim and mm-hmm. games like that. So it was immediately accessible um, and approachable for me. Uh, I only played, I don't know, 30 minutes of it probably at E3, but it was by far the best VR game I've ever played. Like, I was blown away. Like, the first time I put on VR, my jaw dropped and hung open, and it hadn't happened again until I started playing this game. And a lot of it just has to do with the visual quality of the game. Like, a lot of times you watch a, a trailer for a VR game, and then you go play it, and you're like, this looks nothing like the trailers. Mm-hmm. Because you get the screen door effect, and especially with PlayStation VR, like you're, all bets are off as far as visual fidelity is concerned. This was one of those games where you see the trailer, and then you go play it. You're like, oh, my God, it maybe looks better with the HMD on. So big fan of this game. If you buy one VR game this year, I would definitely recommend that this is the one that you get. Um, Boneworks just came out, which was another game that I kind of had my eye on. I haven't had a chance to play it. Initial reviews are mixed. So once I kind of saw the, the reviews for that coming in, this was an easy choice for me. We, the, we, the industry needs more VR games like this. And now that Insomniac is kind of out of the VR game, or at least out of the third party VR game, I wonder how many studios are going to aspire to make games like that because Stormland Mm -hmm. Another kind of really good VR game this year from Insomniac. Um, That is one studio that was pushing to just make great games in VR instead of making a great VR game. Mm -hmm. Um, And Asgard's Wrath to me is the epitome of that. So, again, I'm just going to qualify it by saying it's not the most informed (laughs) opinion on the best VR game of the year, but it's the best one that I played. Um, I think that's the best you can ask for a VR award at this point. Yeah. It's hard. Like, yeah. And also, I have motion sickness problems with it, so I do the best I can, people. That's all I can say. Uh, next up, a genre that kind of comes and goes in our Game of the Year awards because it's a, it used to be the most popular genre. Now it's almost non-existent, but this year it was huge. Like mm-hmm. This may have been the hardest category to pick for me, and that is Best Action Adventure. Um, I knew what you were going to pick, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your pick? Uh, I'm going to pick Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Yep. Um, game of the Year at the Game Awards. Yep. And this is, uh, again, you know, it's the it's from software, making, you know, more of an action-y game than the, than the Dark Souls and Bloodborne, which are, you know, action games, but they lean more toward action RPG, I would say. Yeah. This, is, uh, this has elements of that, but it's much more about the combat system. Yep. Um, there, is al- there is pretty much nothing more satisfying in action gaming than this combat system this year for me 
Um, even going back to it, uh, to you know, it's sort of like, oh, I haven't played it since like June when I, I finished it, like you know, a long time ago. Yeah. So I went back to play it to play it again and re- remind myself, what did I re- like this this much? Was it, <laughs> was it as good as I remember? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And, I even um, enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I mean, it is That's long. A big deal. It, it gets. It gets. Scary, dang, uh, hard in places. Even I, you know, some of my friends who are like hardcore Dark Souls people are like, "It's too hard. I can't do it yeah. because the skill set for Dark Souls is different than the skill set for is. this game. You you need better reflexes in this game to some degree. It's less forgiving in a lot of ways, but it just it nails that kind of the Dark Souls precision and gets that kind of Chambara samurai movie stuff going and then it adds in that tenshu grappling hook with like and they finally figured out a way to do that grappling hook idea without making it feel awkward and slow yeah, it feels and great. it's just yeah. it's just really good all through it um, and you've got that fear of like what the hell is this boss going to be i don't know if i can do this and then every once in a while you do it in the first try and it's like <laughs> you're on top of the world it's great yeah my only i think my only dig at this game is the visuals the graphics are not amazing I th- they're I serviceable think, but I think playing it on PC makes a difference on does that. it like playing on PC it's very sharp okay. it's not you're not going to mistake it for like a next gen game or anything but the details on the character models are much sharper and easier to pick out on PC I think I, I play I also played on PS4 and you're right it has a muddiness to it on yeah. PS4 um, that like it's just not there on the, on the PC um, but one or the other I do like the art style um but I think you're right that uh, the PS4 version is a little. It's not winning best graphics in no. 2019. No, yeah. but it but it it feels really good. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, my pick for best action adventure is Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. You mix Star Wars and Metroid. I'm there. And Dark Souls. And Dark Souls, although. And Sekiro. I mean, there's Sekiro. Yeah, influence there's a little here. bit of L. But to me, it's the perfect amount of that stuff. Mm. It's not like overwhelmingly difficult. Uh, I never felt like I wanted to quit or give up playing this game. And I think a big part of it, too, is that there's other stuff to do. You don't necessarily have to. You can always go back to another area you were in before now that you've got a new ability and unlock mm-hmm. a new part of that area. You're never kind of trapped into this place where you're like, I have to beat this guy or I can't move forward. I think that helped a little bit without, you know, with keeping me from getting frustrated. But also it's like you got the traversal stuff that you don't normally have in those types of games. You got Star Wars. The I think, the, to me, the weakest part of this game was the story, and the story's still pretty great. Mm-hmm. Um, story's hamstrung by the by the setting. Like, yeah. you, you, you can't you can really do so much. solve anything because you have to have the original trilogy happen, so you yeah. can't, like, fix the galaxy. But you can tell a smaller-scale story, and it works for the most part. The characters are good. Oh, uh, BD1, I freaking love. Mm-hmm. Like, people ask me, like, what I wanted for Christmas, and I can't think of anything. Like I, <laughs> Star Wars is two for two on the cute sidekick characters. Yeah. yeah between this BD1 and Baby Yoda... I think we need a team up series, <laughs> like a cartoon series or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, just the game's design, uh, the combat maybe wasn't one hundred percent there. No, I gotta say, playing Sek- Sekiro again, like, really drove home how mushy this yeah. is in comparison. Because I, you know, it was, and but I'm like, oh, it's okay. But like going back to like, oh, no wonder. Like, ha- part of the reason this this game can feel hard is that it just doesn't snap the way Sekiro yeah, does. It's true. Um which is like I mean if every if everyone can do it could do it, everyone would do it. You know, it's yeah. not easy to do that. Um I think they can rumor was today like some stuff came out that said like they're doing it already working on the sequel. Oh. So um it seems to be selling really well. Yeah. I mean it's the fastest selling Star Wars game EA's ever put out. Um, I don't know how much of a compliment that is. I think Battlefront did sell pretty well the first yeah, yeah. one. It did. Both but, of them um, sold pretty well. Yeah. But uh more of this would be great, especially, and it's especially great also because it, you know, they're going to get better it's, at it. It's as the they kind, go. Well, and also because it's the kind of game that EA for years has said doesn't sell and isn't worth right. it. Right. Yeah. And here it and is. And here yeah. it is. Totally worth it. Uh, yeah, I I really really enjoyed this game, and it, and obviously I am a big Star Wars fan, and that helps. Um, but I think objectively, this game is the epitome of the action adventure. I mean, it is – that is the exact – exactly what you do. It's mm. action, and then you're searching around looking for clues. Uh, they're scanning. I mean, it's 
It's yeah, it has all the pieces. I, I would have been more bullish on it if it wasn't quite so rough around all the edges. Yeah. I didn't have as many issues as a lot of people did with this game. No, I, I don't I think I lucky, did either. I it just it just clearly feels like I think it needed six to eight more months in the oven. I would agree with that. Yep. Um, but it, what's there is real good, and I will go back and play it again when I have the time, no question. It is the best lightsaber combat ever done. Um, which is not saying anything really, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but they nailed it. They nailed that. They nailed how powerful the blasters should feel and how, they, you know, when that stormtrooper is shooting at you like that, um, you feel like those things will kill you if they hit you. Yeah. So um, they're it's laser beams. Very well. It's very well done in that regard. <laughs> it, you're right, though. It does create an accurate sense of danger in the Star Wars universe. Like mm-hmm. you, you fear the things you should absolutely fear. From. And. It is the first use of AT-AT instead of AT-AT in-universe in 15 years wait, in Star Wars. Wait, they called it an AT-AT? Yeah. I didn't he, hear that. At one point, when he, when he steals the walker, right before this, actually, when he steals the walker and comes in and for, uh, Forrest Whitaker is like, well, why should we trust you? He's like, well, I brought you an AT-AT. I missed that yeah. somehow. So I've called, always called it AT-AT. Yeah, well, everyone has because that's what they're called. But then <laughs> they, there was this whole thing where they're like, no, they're AT-ATs. Yeah. I'm like, no, they're AT-AT. Like, I had an argument with that with Lucasfilm at one point <laughs> when I was making that show right before Force Awakens came uh, out. Where I, I, I had AT-AT, an AT-AT thing in, there, in the script, and they're like, oh, it's an AT-AT. I'm like, no, it's nope. not. <laughs> here's, here's this commercial for the toy from 1981 where they say AT-AT 15 times so you remember what it's called. Yeah. They're like, well, no, it's an AT-AT. It's, uh, no, and I'm like... So I just cut it out of the script because I refuse <laughs> to say A-T-A-T. Um, but, yeah, Cal calls it an AT-AT, and, like, I will love Cal regardless of whatever anything else that character does forever because he, he brought that back. All right. And I wonder, I want to, I haven't seen Vince uh, or Stig since um, since this came out, but I need to ask them, like, who put that in? Yep. Who, who put AT-AT in and wouldn't take it out? Well, last we'll at PAX party this year at E3. Yeah. Uh, next up, best platformer. This is one of those categories that comes and goes in our Game of the Year awards because some years there mm-hmm. just aren't enough of them. Some years there are 8,000 indie platformers that come out in 12 months. This year was a pretty slow year, but there were enough games for us to pick winners. Matt, what was your pick for best platformer? Uh, I went with Super Mario Maker 2. Hard to argue against that. This was a... I mean, honestly, this is the only platformer I particularly liked this year. Yeah, interesting. Um, Because I didn't play Yoshi's Crafted World because I hate Yoshi. (laughs) Um, I didn't play the ukulele game. Um, The Possible Lair, Impossible Lair. Yeah, and I don't, can't remember anything else I really played platform-wise. It was not a big year for platforming. So so I went with this kind of by default, but also because I did like it. It didn't capture me the way the first one did probably because like obviously it's it's more of an update because it should have just been like an expansion to the first game much, let's yeah. be honest um but i mean the first game's trapped on the wii u so yeah you gotta do what you gotta do yep um i still go i still just load it up and play some levels once in a while i guess you know it's, it's kind of a standard go-to like in the way that you say like you play a round of uh, call of duty whenever you have five minutes like this is kind of my quick five minute yep. game um yeah, so I mean, I don't have, you know, I don't think, I don't think this game needs me to stand no, for it. Really, it's it just, it's just, it, it's a known is, quantity. Yeah, you, either you love it or you're indifferent. And, and the upgrade updates have been good. The, the adding Zelda or not Zelda Link is a power up, and the Zelda elements. Like, yeah. I think that's really cool. Um, it I, makes me I, wonder I, if we'll ever get like a Zelda maker, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I suck at them. So, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but like the videos on YouTube are neat. I honestly um, spend more time watching videos of people playing the levels in this game than playing the game. Yeah, I probably have spent more time watching Patrick <laughs> Klepek play this than I've actually played it. That's it's true. Funny, but uh, I just don't have the patience to get through some of those levels. But I like I like watching other people torture themselves trying to do it. So, uh, so there you go, Super Mario Gal or Super Mario Galaxy, Super Mario Maker yeah, Two. For you Matt. wish. <laughs> yeah, I do wish that would have been an easy pick. Super yeah. Mario Galaxy Three done. Uh, my pick for best platformer is a game that Matt just mentioned, Yoshi's Crafted World. Um, I did play this all the way to the end. Um, I have an irrational hatred of Yoshi. Like, I don't excuse it at all. It's just I don't I think am. it's that irrational. In fact, Jeff Gersman hates Yoshi more than you do. I guarantee it. Like, he hates Yoshi. <laughs> and you talk to him, he won't really give you a reason. He's like, I, don't, I just hate him. I just, I did, He's just dumb. I hate him. Like... <laughs> funny. I don't and, know why. Like, I should like... He's a dinosaur. Yeah, he's from my favorite annoying. Mario game. <laughs> um, Mario World. Like, I don't know why I hate him, but I do. I, I get why you hate him. He's not a great character. He just isn't. Like, his functionality is cool. The fact that he can sort of eat things and, you know, use them as ammunition. That is kind of a cool concept or a cool tweak. 
But otherwise, he's not really that great of a character, in my opinion. I mean, maybe yeah. there's like a Yoshi club fan club out there. I don't. There know. are hardcore Yoshi fans are out there. there. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm well. Yeah, I've seen it. Well, like, I didn't enjoy this game because it starred eight thousand Yoshi's or even just one Yoshi. I, I really liked it because it again it does something different. It has this weird sh- uh, perspective shifting mechanic that happens in the game where, and it's used in myriad ways and to creative effect. Uh, there's lots of times where you just kind of stumble upon rooms because you're you're there's like a cardboard cutout standing in front of you and you're just kind of like got Yoshi behind it and you're kind of wiggling around. Next thing you know, you find this new pathway that can take you somewhere completely different. You're like, oh, that's how I get to that thing that I could see that I couldn't figure out how to get to. Um, the other part of it too is that there are some really challenging platforming sections in this game. The game itself isn't that difficult it's pretty forgiving as far as like checkpoints and lives and things like that and earning extra lives but there are definitely parts of this game where i had to play them over and over and over again just to complete them now i never ran out of lives and you know lost a bunch of progress or anything like that but there's some serious platforming in this game as well i think a lot of people may look at this game and like oh it's more like an adventure game where you're tossing yoshi's eggs around that's really not the case at all it's a good mix of everything of adventuring sort of the whole perspective shift and challenging platforming for sure um and some pretty good combat as well mixed in there with the platforming so Mm -hmm. it was not an amazing year for platformers in general in 2019 but to me this game was head and shoulders above the rest. I hate Yoshi. I do too. I, do. I, I hate the way he stands. I, I hate the little <laughs> shell on his back. Like, I don't know why. I hate how his nose bounces when he talks. I, I hate, hate how he doesn't really have, like, a tail. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I hear you. I don't know what. It's it's ir- completely irrational. I don't know what. I don't know what <laughs> lizard brain thing that triggers in me. But, like, I hate Yoshi. All right. Well, we'll move on. I don't then. even like looking at this footage. Get it off. Get Next. it off the screen. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, All right, next up, best strategy game. This is another category where we both pick the same exact game, and that is Fire Emblem Three Houses. Um, One of the it was a good year for strategy games. It was a good year. It was a it was not an easy category to pick. Uh, This is one of like the game. This is like the people's choice. Yeah. Game of the year for the Game Awards. And like Fallen Order came in second, I think. Yeah, which wasn't even considered. It didn't make the cu- it didn't make yeah. the cutoff, but the fans like the fans rallied. still wanted to rally around it. Look, Nintendo fans are crazy, so it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that you know a bunch of Nintendo fans yeah. voted for. Although I, if I if one I thought Smash Brothers would win. Yeah, that, that was surprising. I, was, I yeah. thought the Smash the Smash community would rally, but, uh, but it, it was Fire Emblem. It was the Fire Emblem community, which I didn't even know there was a big Fire Emblem community in the first place. Um, Oh, you, you need to be on Twitter more. Yeah, I guess. I th- I don't think I really do need to be on Twitter more. No, I think I'm on there but, just enough. <laughs> but it is it is it's a big deal. Yeah. Um. Well, we both love this game. Yeah. Um. It would I would never consider it for game of the year. I'll say that. But it was a good strategy game. I mean, as far as production values are concerned, uh, the actual depth of the battle system and the combat, uh, the story was great. Um. The only real knock I have against it is that the production values are eh, here and there. They're a little switchy. Yeah, they are. <laughs> it's doing its best. It's doing all she yeah. can. But I mean, it's still uh, it's still pretty good looking for a Fire Emblem game. Well, the anime stuff been, looks amazing. They've been on handheld for a long time. I, I don't think they've ever quite topped the old hand drawn 2D animations. I agree. Like you know, of the of the combat. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think they're ever gonna match that it was great to see a lot of these characters in this world though at that level of fidelity after it being sort of a handheld franchise for after all this time uh so it was good to see Mm -hmm. i mean this game was kind of in development hell like intelligent systems kind of bailed on it and they had to get help i can't remember what studio came in to help him finish it may have been like koei tecmo or something it was koei yeah yeah tecmo help the the dynasty warriors guys came in well it Hey, it worked, you know? Yeah. Intelligent Systems is... I think it uses the same engine <laughs> oh, as, really? like, as Fire Emblem Warriors. Oh, okay. Fact. That makes sense, too. Um, but again, this is also a game that you can play multiple times because you can yep. choose a different school to join, and it drastically changes how the game or is played. team up with different characters. And yeah. All that. yeah. Build your characters differently. Um, I was a blue lion. <laughs> but I went with uh, the red. Uh, what are they? Red eagles. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But you can go back and play as any of the different factions, mm-hmm. and it changes the story and like who you fight in certain skirmishes. It was a little too easy. 
It was pretty easy. Like a lot of Nintendo games, though, to be honest. Like, I just walked through Pokemon Sword and Shield. Like, it was Pokemon. nothing. Yeah, but the Pokemon base game is always that. It's the it's the post game that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, this game was easy, this too. This was though. pretty... I thought this was pretty easy for a Fire Emblem. Yeah. And you could turn off Permadeath, too, if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, that's been true. Of, In for, hindsight, maybe I should have left it on. That's been true of, like... To make it more challenging. Most of the Fire Emblems for, like... Five Plus or six three. of these. It'll been several of them. Yeah. yeah. Casual yeah. mode is not a new thing here. No, but maybe in hindsight I shouldn't have used it. I should have. I mean, I don't, casual mode doesn't make it any harder to die, uh, easier to die or anything. Yeah. It just means that if you do die, I mean, I didn't have anyone die, I don't think, the whole time. I Except did. like one, I, I think maybe did. one rando, like weird, like one, one of the weird little axe dudes who never became anything of note, I think died early on. I had That's characters. I had a couple characters die, but it wasn't that big a deal. Again, it was really easy, but. Um, it was great to see this IP in 3D and pretty well imagined. Um, the the anime in it was great. I wish there was more of it. Um, but o- overall, I mean, then you have all the school mechanics. Like, watching this B-roll is bringing back oh, yeah. a lot of the memories of this game. And it is a very deep game with a lot of different systems. I, know, I definitely understand why so many Harry Potter fans like oh, it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it is kind of Harry Potter, this it's strategy like, Yeah, it's like, Harry, it's like Hogwarts the combat academy yeah. basically yeah but a great strategy game um did you have any other picks that you want to mention um we both picked the probably same like one? second place for me would be three kingdoms uh the total war three kingdoms yeah uh, the Di- the dynasty warriors yeah. uh, uh total war game yeah um i just fire emblem is a much like lighter and easier to sort of like flow along with game total war requires a lot more thought i think it's just more fun honestly yeah Total War is a much more rigid, almost like simulation of yeah. But total, I mean, Total War is probably the best representation of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms story oh, I've for seen. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, it just gets into it really well. Um, you just have to have the patience to play a Total War game. Yep, and um, it does take patience, and it takes a long time to learn. Yeah, how to play those games. I tried Three Kingdoms, and I didn't get very far before I was like, this is just too much. No, I mean, I played it back when it, right around, right around after it came out, I think, and I've kind of gone back to it periodically. Um, this game I played for like 80 hours straight when it came, I mean, Fire Emblem I played I think my final more. clock was like 65 hours for Fire Emblem or mm-hmm. something. I mean, if you're going to stick with a game that long, it's pretty good. It's probably good. Yep. Uh, next up, best fighting game. Once again, a uh, category that both you and I agree on, mm-hmm. and the winner is... Mortal, Mortal Kombat, Kombat 11. Uh, not an Almost um, by default. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say that because Mortal Kombat 11 is great. Yeah. It's a great fighting game. It deserves fighting game of the year, but you're right. It, there was just no competition. It really. didn't face a lot of the competition. The only other game I would even consider in the same bracket would probably be Samurai Showdown. Yep, uh, that was my other consideration. Just because of how different it is. And the reason I didn't go with Samurai Showdown over Mortal Kombat 11, well, there's a million reasons, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you're right, it is a different kind of a fighting style for a fighting game. That part of it I like, but the production values are really low in that well, Mortal game. Mortal Kombat's just got more of a total it just has package. everything. I yeah. mean, it's just... It, it's almost overwhelming how much content there I mean, is in Mortal Nether Kombat. Realm has pretty much mastered, between this and the Injustice games, has pretty much mastered a fighting game that's worth 60 bucks. Yep. I'd like to see what can topple Nether Realm's game. So whenever the, whenever the next mm-hmm. one comes out in two years, like what what will it take? I don't know. From a fighting franchise to best what Nether Realm is doing. I mean, I you just mean like other than Nether Realm, right? The competition. Yeah, I don't know. I, I you could like expand Street Fighter VI out to have this kind of like level of, but I don't know if Capcom's up for that. You I, know mean, I mean, we've seen them try to do story modes. I can, and it's, yeah. I can see them do that. And, like, the smart thing about Mortal Kombat is they've always built it around the narrative to some degree, partly because it's based on, you know, old kung fu movies. Yeah. Like, you know, it has a narrative built into it because it comes from that sort of pulp schlock yeah. of the 70s that, like, you know, that's all drawn from and, and also kind of the, the, the um, Big Trouble in Little China aspect. Um, and so you can kind of like do just like a crazy over the top kind of gods and monsters story out of it. Same with like how in- why Injustice works. Injustice comes from DC Comics, so yep. you can kind of just tell a DC Comics story. And then, by the fact they've set it into an alternate universe means they can play in that world however they want and make Superman evil and kill all these characters off. And it doesn't matter because it's not the the real DC universe, right? Yeah. So that's sort of also I think where, where their strength is. Where like Nether Realms is not afraid to tell this R rated like death dealing story where anything can happen and anyone can get killed off it's kind of got a game of thrones element to it and not just tell it 
tell it very well with extremely yeah. high production values. Like, I just don't see... Like, they resemble, like, the best of, like, the DC animated direct and DVD movies. Yeah. You know? like, like, I they're, just... They're good. Looking down the road, it's just hard for me to see another studio... I don't think any other doing. studio making fighting games has been built to do what NetherRealm does. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like no other fighting game studio has a narrative team as robust as these guys. And like the closest I think you get is probably like Blaze Blue. Yeah. Um, which is very repetitive, not, not on the same level, but it does have the depth of lore. Um, but That's obviously important. It doesn't have the production value, obviously. Even if, look, even if NetherRealm made the next Street Fighter game, let's say Capcom just gives it to him and says, you're making the next Street Fighter, I still don't think it would be as good as what... NetherRealm is doing already because of mm. what you said, the lore and the universe. Like, Street Fighter is just this very kind of flimsy, mm-hmm. flim flam like, like concept. Street Fighter has built out the characters, but they haven't built out the world or the premise the enough lore. to really matter. And, yeah. like, it's all kind of set around the idea of the Street Fighter tournament. Yeah. And. And sort of the lack, the fairly lackluster idea of psycho power or you know sin or whatever Bison's organization is this time around or what Shadowloo stuff. Whereas this is like you know gods and demons and interdimensional monsters fighting for the control of reality. I mean the, the stakes are just bigger on this. It's a like, blank canvas. You and can your main fill characters, your main characters are kind of ethereal gods and and Shaolin monks and ninjas and like what's your main character in Street Fighter? a guy who walks around looking for fighting tournaments to go in. You yeah. know, it's like, and like, who else is your main, you, you, you don't never focus on Ryu, there's nothing else. When Street Fighter 2 came out, that one day, hey, you know, we may, yeah. maybe games are going to be insane, and we're going to need to have some actual story and lore. Yeah. Well, here's, actually, you know, here you know who the only real competition in terms of that sort of presentation probably is, and I didn't think of it because I don't care about the series very much, was Tekken. Yeah. Tekken 7 actually did make some strides towards yeah. this level. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, it's trying a, at least. A Tekken 8 could potentially be like Mortal Kombat 10 territory. Yeah, but they're going to be playing catch up for they're a gonna long They're going to be catch, playing catch up for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And, and just a note as well, um, people may be wondering, like, where's Super Smash Brothers? Well, for us, Super Smash Brothers was in the awards last yeah, year. Yeah, they made it last year. Last year they made it for us, so they were not under consideration. Yeah, we don't for cut this stuff year. off halfway through November. But I'll be perfectly honest with you: even if Smash was in this year, I would still give. No, I would. Best I would also game. pick Mortal Kombat over Smash. Yep. I'm not. I didn't. I like Smash, but it didn't set my world on fire. Nothing really has since Melee yeah. in that series, frankly. Yep. All right. Up next, best driving game. This, so we mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that Matt decided to abstain from one of the categories in yeah. our awards today. I got nothing. And this is the category that Matt has decided to abstain from. I think I only played one racing game this year, and I, it was uh, Need for Speed Heat, and I refused to give that an award. So I played, of, of, the, of the racing games, I played a lot. I played a lot of Need for Speed Heat. I played a lot of Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. And then just recently, I finally got to play this game, which is... F1 2019. And I just want to say, if there are any PR people out there watching this show or listening to this show on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, it is very smart to reach out to journalists at the end of the year and ask them if they want to play your game for Game of the Year consideration because that's what happened with this game, and here it is. Sifted's Driving Game of the Year for 2019, F1 2019. I had not played an F1 game. I don't even know how long it's been. Probably 10, 12 years or something like that since I played an F1 game. And so I, the last thing I remembered about playing an, F, an F1 game is that it was insanely difficult and hard. This game, you can tell that Codemasters over time has figured out that a lot of people have been intimidated by F1 games and made... It, here, here's the thing, though. They didn't make it a casual F1 game. They made it a game that casuals can jump into and play and have fun with, but you can also turn all that stuff off and just go straight sim. I was also impressed with the story mode in this, which I was shocked by because, again, the last F1 story mode I played was a joke. It was basically two rooms. One was, like, the inside where you won, and the other was out by your trailer. And hmm. the, the entire story played out in those two settings – that has completely changed. Uh, they have dove headfirst into esports with this, and it's all just baked into the game. I'm not an esports guy, but I could see where people playing this 
it would be very easy for them to get into it and then suddenly be hooked. And all next thing you know, you're a part of the F1 esports community. So this was a very pleasant surprise to me. Um, again, I, I thank the PR person who sent it to me because it deserves driving game of the year. And now that I've played it, I was able to give it driving game of the year. Well, I'll take your word for that. Yep. <laughs> you're not going to try it yourself. Is that what you're saying, Matt? I mean, maybe one day if it's like nine bucks or something. <laughs> well, it might be. They're not big sellers, uh, the no. F1 games in general. I also, not I, just, the US. I also don't care about F1 racing. Like, it's, I, Formula is not interesting to me, really. I'm, I'm a... I'm, I'm not a form F1 person. I'm not a NASCAR person. I'm more of a, you know, st- exotic or street racing fan. You know, Gran Turismo based stuff. Basically, yeah. it's is my thing. I'm interested in. My um, dad was a big F1 fan, so he, I was kind of forced to watch it growing yeah. up, like on the weekends. Like Le Mans 24 Hour is interesting. That's to me. insane. Um, that race is nuts. I played that one. You know that, that Dreamcast game. That by, literally, uh, you could do the 24 Hour yeah, race. We did that. We did. We had tag teams <laughs> like, it was, it was 20, for 24 hours. What place hours. did you finish in? I don't remember. No, not first. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, but like it, yeah, it was a that was Melbourne, Melbourne House, man. That was, Melbourne House was a great, great studio. They were they some really good stuff. They really did back in the day. Yep. Did they make the driver game the good one? I think they did, and I think they also made the Transformers Armada game. I think you're right. Which was really good. Yeah. Are uh, they still around? Even I don't know. They, they absorbed. Shut down. They were or absorbed something? or shut down or something because they were through. Uh, I think they were through. Were they THQ? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. That would be a nice retro story if somebody, somebody wanted to do on like what happened to Melbourne House. Melbourne House was one of the around the Dreamcast era. They were one of the top developers. They were kind of legendary. They were great. It's crazy. Crazy to think about. Uh, Next up, best game as a service, a category we've been forced to include in our awards over the last couple years because it's it's just, it's a thing now in gaming. I think your computer crashed. Did it crash? I don't know. I don't know. It won't wake up. Yeah, it won't wake up. You're right. It's like an Evanescence song over here. Well, the good news is I don't think I need it, honestly. Then you won't see the chat. Yeah. That is a problem. You'll need it by the end. Oh, you're right. That's a good point. I don't know what happened. It just sh- turned yeah, off. Yeah, just stop. <laughs> it just weird. shut down, and it won't wake up. Space bar, mouse, nothing. Hmm. Even hit the power button, it won't turn on. Anyway, best game as a service. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, this is basically games that just continue to live on. They mm-hmm. released the base version of it, and they just keep adding to it with DLC and season passes and new content. I think by now everyone knows what a gas is. Matt, what's your pick for best game as a service for 2019? Uh, my pick is Final Fantasy XIV. Um, so this is kind of a nod to some degree in the sense that uh, Shadowbringers is you know re- reputed by many who played it to be one of the best things that came out this year. I did not get to play it because it's 200-some hours into this game. Uh, and I didn't want to do the thing where you skip the whole game and start it like without knowing what the hell you're doing because that's just not how I roll. Um, but what I, I have played like close to 100 hours. I'm getting there. Like I'll get there eventually. When I do get to play Shadowbringers, we will talk about it on the show. But um, whenever that happens next year sometime. But what I have played of it, I really liked, and I, I appreciated kind of what they were doing. I don't doing. think you're alone, man. <laughs> and uh, Everybody's I, been talking about this game this year. Yeah. Out of nowhere. I mean, yeah. it's been out for what, like, Five Several years, years now? and that's not even cl- in- including like the part where they shut it down and remade it from the ground up. Right. Um, and then, uh, e- so yeah, so I think uh, I had to give it a nod for just sort of you know being a, a pl- very pleasant surprise in terms of like how much fun I'm having playing a Final Fantasy game again for the first time probably since twelve. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's I I am not impressed with the direction Final Fantasy has gone in pretty much since ten. With the ex- you know, twelve was a high point, but beyond right that, I, you, I haven't yeah. really liked anything they've done. This feels like Final Fantasy. This feels like a you know, it's because you don't really need other players much, except for like you know, instance dungeons, which you sort of join a queue and 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 join up that way. Um, yeah, that was a hard crash. Yeah, that my, was a f- my PC had just popped back up. It basically had a got hard the unhappy face and the blue <laughs> screen and everything. Wow. I've never seen that. It's a blue screen of death on Windows Ten. Yeah, never seen that before. And. Um, 
so I just wanted to kind of give this give it give it a nod because I haven't had a lot of like good games of service rep, uh, experiences that, this year. And as a matter of fact, this wasn't one either because if you buy this on Steam, see, you, I was a little puzzled. You by have it, to go your, through your all, but that's not the game's fault. That's yeah. the Square's fault. But it's this is best game as a service. So doesn't the service part of it tie into it a little bit? Not really, because what they're doing to you know give you what they're giving you in the game as the service is very good. The problem is that Square, as a whole, as a company is terrible about like all their interface, you know, because this is also the same interface you have to deal with if you're on Final Fantasy XI and any of their other stuff that involves a subscription thing. It's just very confused and very user unintuitive and they're not helpful on the phone afterwards. Well, the crazy thing was it was nominated for like best community support at the Game Awards. Yeah, that's nuts. And I was remembering what you were telling me about I've lost $45 to this game into the ether because because I, I... I was like, wait a minute. I thought it was like the worst service. It was. It was it's, absolutely, it's the worst customer service of any game-related thing I've had, it, not just this year, probably the last five years. It's terrible. Because it's like all in the same account, but like there's different service accounts under that account, and one of the service accounts by default is your free trial, and then one of the service accounts is your Steam thing, and when you go to buy the subscription or whatever, it just like defaults to the the first one which is your free account and then like unless you know all ahead of time it doesn't even check with you it's just a drop down menu and it doesn't check with you and say hey make sure you're putting this on which which account it is it just lets you do the charge and there's no way to reverse it yeah that's bad and then you talk that's to them and like, hey can, can you just move the, i meant to buy it on this and not that can you just move it over to this and they're like no we can't do that i'm like i think you can and you just won't so not pleased with that but that's not the game's fault you know, the, the developers of the game didn't make so that So you're saying happen. the game itself, as far as having ongoing content, yeah. is your pick for... Yeah, it's, it's integrating cool things, integrating near. You know, they put a near dungeon up. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's a lot of, like, nice little references to things and fun costumes you can get. not And not always paid. Like, you can earn them in yeah. the game. Um, so, yeah, I think it's... it's And it feels good to play. You can play with mouse and keyboard or with a controller. It works works just fine on both. I generally do play with a controller because it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, you know, it's an MMO. Um... So yeah, I've enjoyed my time with it. I just haven't had enough time to get to the part that everybody says is a game of the year contender. So we'll see. Okay. But I wanted to give it an acknowledgement of some kind. I have a feeling my pick is most definitely going to surprise some people. Um, My choice for the best game as a service for 2019 is Fortnite. (laughs) I never thought I would, if you talked to me in January, I never would have dreamed. Um... I probably would have guessed the Division 2 or something like that would have been my pick, but no. And it's not even that I I don't even really like Fortnite. I'll just be perfectly honest with you. I jumped back in this year with the new season to play it and check in on it. And I'm glad I did because it made me realize that it is the best game as a service. Because, one, it's... I don't think there's ever going to be a Fortnite 2. It's like I look at all these other games as a service, and I'm like, oh, we already have a Division 2. We already have a Destiny 2. I don't think there's going to be a Fortnite 2 because Mm -hmm. they have done such an amazing job of keeping the players engaged. And they seem to be really willing to just straight up reinvent it when they have to and not literally throw they'll suck the whole it. world into a black hole and just start over like no game does that the other part of it too is that and jeff keely touched on this a little bit on the game awards is what epic is doing with Fortnite is unlike anything any other publisher is doing with a game as a service meaning these events that happen in game for in some cases millions of people This, Matt, is going to be huge going forward. It is going to be a gigantic revenue driver for Epic Games and any other publisher that does it. Because you can sell themed events inside your game Mm -hmm. as if they're an event that happens in the real world. Now, hopefully it works better in the future. Because the Star Wars thing this weekend was pretty much a disaster. Yeah. But, like, the concert that they did... The concert like, was good. The that, like, ki- 10 the ki- million people watched. The kaiju battle was great. Yeah. Like, again, they're they're trailblazing. Fortnite was a trailblazer when it started as this battle royale thing. Yeah, I hope whoever thought of that got a big raise. Uh, seriously. Because, I mean, they're get, that is going to generate literally, like, a billion dollars yeah. when it's all said and done. Doing in-game events in Fortnite. Mm-hmm. And that, again, I'm a kind of a person who, when we do these awards, I like always... they're going to be able to pick and choose. Yeah. They're going to be able to, like, pit people against each other. They'll be like, well, that weekend is booked, and so-and-so is offering us a million whatever. What, do, what are you going to offer us? Like, 
it is genius. And it, I, again, I don't think it'll be long until other games start doing it. But I would also argue that maybe Fortnite is the only game that can really pull it off. Yeah. I mean, I almost reinstalled it to play with the lightsabers this week. Yeah. I mean, and, but, and that's the thing. Like, they're always rolling content into the game that maybe f- mm-hmm. the, the last five you didn't care about. But then that sixth one shows up, and it's something you absolutely care about. And either you go back into the world and you play it, or you at least ponder, like, reinstalling it or whatever. I, again, I'm not the world's biggest Fortnite fan, but to me it's just really hard to deny that it's not dominating this space right yeah. now. It well, and also, like, no, everyone else looks like they're standing still. Yeah. I mean, like, look at it, even Apex Apex Legends. has nothing it's compared like, to it. Its updates are so infrequent, and when mm-hmm. they do happen, they're insignificant. Like, I, to me, this category. Where are the Titans? Yeah. Exactly. So you have what you need. I get it. A Put lot them of in. a lot of people hate this game. They they feel like maybe it's ruining gaming or it's dragging away their hardcore gamer friends into casual land. I get all that. Their children won't stop playing it. Yeah, yep. Yeah. But there's just no denying that Epic is doing this better than anyone else right now. It's just the way it is. All right. Next up, best platform. So this is where we pick what platform. Um, PlayStation, Xbox, PC, Switch, mobile, whatever, VR. What platform was the best in 2019? Mm -hmm. PlayStation 4 has won this every year. I I won. Did Xbox win once? I picked PC once. PC once. But for me, I think it's been a straight flush since it did launch for PS4. That changes this year. Mm -hmm. And we both picked the same platform, and that platform is Switch. Switch. Not even close. No. Like, there's been nothing com- comparable to the consistency of the Switch this year. I mean, software At least output, once a month, something worth playing. And, yeah, something good worth yeah. playing. Uh, the first-party output this year has been the best so far for Switch, without a doubt. We didn't get the big blockbusters like a Mario mm-hmm. or a Zelda, but this is where all the, like, the B-level guys started yeah. filling in. We got in. something of quality, of noteworthy quality every every time. And they were all good. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Like, every first-party release has been, at the very least, good. And most even of the, them have been great. Even the gimmicky bullshit fitness game yeah. was pretty good. Yeah, still pretty damn good. And you start thinking about they launched the Switch Lite this year, which mm-hmm. opens up the platform to people who can only afford to spend 200 bucks on it. So... It's just been it's been a stellar year for Nintendo. Um, it's I think the other thing for me too is that this is usually the period where we see Nintendo starting to slack off. Yep. This is where you start to see software releases shrink yep. for Nintendo's. But I think instead you're seeing it, you're seeing the dividends of um, one platform. no longer having the 3DS to support. Yep. And it's like bravely default too. I made fun of its visuals, but you know that game would have been on 3DS mm-hmm. if the Switch wasn't there. So. We are absolutely getting games on Switch that we normally would have got on whatever other handheld Nintendo had at the time, and it makes a huge difference for a Nintendo software library for the platform. Um, it's just been great. Like, it's probably Nintendo's best console ever. Maybe. I have, it's I, not I, done yet. I, it's not. And I struggle to think of a better one, honestly. Like, it has to be either the NES or the SNES. Mm, it be the SNES or the uh, or the GameCube for me. Oh, really? It's gonna, you put GameCube up there, huh? It's going to lean real hard on how good Metroid Prime 4 is. Metroid kind of makes or breaks a Nintendo system for me most Understandable. Uh, it's one of its biggest franchises. And in honesty, the only big franchise we have yet to get on yep. Switch. Um, that just shows you the kind of work that Nintendo's been doing on this platform. Um, you know, we're going to get a second Zelda here probably within 12 months time yep. for the first time. in since the Wii. Yeah. Yeah. Only two systems ago, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that's 10 years yeah. <laughs> in video game time. That's how it works. So I mean, we got multiples on Wii U, but they were remastered. So yeah. Um, it, it this was an easy pick for me. Like, mm-hmm. I, I think I knew this back in like June, <laughs> This switch was going to yeah. win platform. There wasn't of the year. anything else on the schedule. Yeah, once stuff, especially once stuff started falling out for the other platforms yeah. and getting pushed back to 2020, it just opened up the pathway for Switch. And not that I'm saying that's why it won. It probably would have won anyway because Nintendo just had an absolutely incredible year. So congratulations to Nintendo with Switch. Um, very easily earned this award for 2019. Next up, best story. Mm. It's not very often that we we reward two different games with best RPG and best story. Usually they're intertwined, but not mm-hmm. always, but usually they are. 
And this year, that was the case because we both have the same winner, yeah. and that's Disco, Disco Elysium. Elysium. Yeah. It's, again, that's a no-brainer. It's not, it's not, there are no other contenders. No. Really. Like when I said earlier, like these awards for me were either obvious or splitting hairs. Yeah. This was one of the obvious ones. Like, and I still haven't even finished it. So I, I, the story may get, even get better as it goes. Like yeah. as, as I get deeper into the game. Um, I wish I could take this with me over the holidays. Yeah, I, I understand. I that. wish I could take it with me on my flights to and from the East Coast. This and, was, and I never say this, this would be good on the Switch. It would be. Because it's not really it's all not that It's not graphically much. intensive. Yeah, and it's not even about that. It's not Twitch-based. Yep. You could play it at your leisure. It would be a good game to have on a plane. Yep, absolutely. That's what I wish. I wish when I fly out here in two days that I had this on my Switch to play. Um, and I have, I have a feeling that this game is only, only going to grow in stature as it does reach more platforms. I know yep. people may watch these awards right now, and they're like, what's Matt and Shane on about this Disco Elysium crap? Well, I have a feeling in a year or two's time, they're going to be like, oh, Yeah, once this I hits get consoles, you're going to start to see people make, oh, I get it. Yep. I see. They'll see. So the story Microsoft, put this on Game Pass immediately. Yeah. Get this out there. Yeah. That would get be get it idea. in people's hands. That's Absolutely. all you need to do. Yep. Great story, great adventure, great role playing. Very it's, funny. Yeah, it's just, it's all that. Very next funny, up, very smart. Yep. Next up, one of my favorite categories from our Game of the Year awards every year. Uh, this category is called Future Legend. And this is where we pick a game that maybe flew under the radar a little bit. It doesn't have to. But most importantly, that we think decades from now, people are still going to point to and say, that was a great game. Maybe they say that was a great game that was underappreciated, but most importantly, they're going to say, even decades from now, that was a great game. Matt, what is your pick? Uh, my pick is Sekiro, um, which I don't think flew under the radar too much. Yeah. At, least, at the very least, it won the game award for game of the year. Um, but I don't think it was a, you know, it wasn't a massive you know, Zelda level hit or anything. Um, but my main reason for thinking it's going to be a future legend is I think this game is going to inform sword combat for decades to come. And I think you already saw it with Fallen Order, which was yeah. basically going off what we knew about the combat in that game from, you know, pre-release stuff. Uh, there is really no better feeling sword combat uh, in games, I don't think, at least in terms of trading blows. Like, I think there's people that would say Dark Souls is a little better because the hitboxes are, are more uh, accurate. But in terms of, like, two people with swords trying to fight through each other's defense and get that opening to get that kill, there's nothing else like this game. Uh, the give and take is amazing. And I think uh, in the same way, like, The Witcher 3 is starting, you're starting to see that influence, like, how stories are told in open worlds and how RPGs treat side quests. Sekiro is just going to quietly influence everyone who makes a game with a sword in it for years. So I think, I think that, that's why I pick it. I also think games this year are a little light on the ground in terms of future legend status. Agreed. I didn't, I, it was hard to think of one that I really felt was going to be that. And I think this is actually kind of a weak pick. In some regard, some ways, uh, because it's more about influencing a particular gameplay mechanic rather than the whole package, but um, it's the best I got. Okay, my pick for Future Legend is a game that I've been championing for now for the last month and a half, and that game is Luigi's Mansion Three. I feel like this game has just been released and just forgotten about. Um, I think it won like Best Family Game at the Game Awards or yeah, something like that, which I, obviously it should have won. Um, I also feel that it's going to be kind of a victim of what we were talking about earlier, where the Switch is just having one hell of a year and one a hell of a the last two years or whatever. Um, so many great first-party games have released for Switch that I feel like this one is just going to slip through the cracks for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge mistake. It is some of the most fun that I had playing a game in 2019. And the other thing I would say about it is that its visuals are never going to age. This game's never going to look old. Yeah, this is going to be like the way Wind Waker was on yeah. the GameCube. It's timeless. People just point out and say, look, it still looks great. It still looks great. I mean, even if you look at the original Luigi's Mansion for GameCube, other than the fact that it's like in 4 by 3 aspect ratio, it still looks great. But this destroys it. Like, after I played this, I was like, man, like, is this that much better? Oh, yes, it's that much better looking than the mm -hmm. original game. Um, I've already, like, gushed over this game on Game Face several times. I don't need to sort of 
beat that drum more, but I just wanted to give more perspective on why I think it's going to be a future legend because I think this is one of those games that people are going to go back to decades from now and be like, hot damn, why didn't people talk more about this game when it came out? And I think a big reason why is because the Switch is just so damn awesome and it has so many great games already. So I, I, love I also Luigi's think this game is a, a lot of people look at this game and think it shouldn't be full price. Oh, really? Which is weird. But why? Because there's a thing with Luigi's Mansion where people feel like it's probably going to be too short, which I don't think this one is. The first one absolutely um, the first was. one was. And the, sec- and the other thing, of course, is the previous one was a handheld game. And there's sort of a, a feeling of, like, oh, is this just a handheld game I stuck on that. the Switch? Yeah. Which as soon as you play it, you know it's not, but you got to spend that 60 bucks first. Yeah. Or just listen to us telling you that you it's could. worth the 60 yeah. bucks. <laughs> That's kind of what we're here for, at least. But... Uh, I love this game. It's one of my favorite games of the year. You have to wait here about 30 or 40 minutes to find out if I give it game of the year. But, uh, yeah, one of the best of the year. I don't think a lot of people are talking about it or playing it. Uh, and I think, ultimately, the test of time will... will. Yeah, you could do worse than to stick this one on your Christmas list. I would absolutely... If you haven't bought this, I absolutely tell you to put this on your Christmas list and let somebody else buy it for you. You will thank me when we come back in 2020. All right, next up, most pleasant surprise. Um, this category is always interesting because you can take it anywhere. It can be right. anything. It could be a game that you didn't think was going to be as, as good as it ended up being. It could be something that a company did that you were pleasantly surprised by. It could be yourself. Maybe you've changed your, your approach with certain genres or you like things now that you didn't like. What's your pick, Matt, for most pleasant surprise of 2019. Uh, my pick is Untitled Goose Game. Um, I didn't think this was good enough to kind of hit the best of stuff overall, um, but I did think it was a, a genuinely charming. I mean, honestly, it's, I probably picked it because you have pleasant in the name of this <laughs> in the name of this category, yeah. and that is kind of the na- the word I associate the most with this game. It was pleasant. It was it was. Wonderfully fun to play a, a terrible goose, her, uh, just thoroughly harassing a bunch of poor English people. Do you want? Uh, do you want that Beaker game that was shown at the Game Awards? Not really. No, I know that that's a that's a darling and all, but uh, I, I've never been a huge Beaker fan. Um, I think the goose is fine the way it is. Yeah, it's kind of perfect all on its own, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you give me a uh, Statler and Waldorf uh, heckling simulator, maybe, I'll, <laughs> maybe I got, now you got my attention. <laughs> That was pretty clever, though, and I like that they actually, like, built kind of the game and put Beaker in there. Like, mm-hmm. it's pretty sweet. Oh, yeah, it was, it was very impressive uh, production value. But, uh, yeah, I, I, this was kind of a lark. I was like, oh, everybody's talking about this game. I guess I'll play it before the show comes on. It's like, yeah, I played through the whole damn thing, like, right, right in one sitting. It's not that long, but, like... It was, uh, it's charming and I laughed out loud very funny. a lot at this game. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I, you know, I know people are kind of sick of it to some degree and I go, like, oh, it's all a meme thing and people just like it cause it's memes or whatever. But it's like, you know what? No, it's really that pretty much that good. Yeah, it is. Um, there's just other stuff that I liked better, spoke to me more. I felt were more robust game. Yeah. It's not a particularly deep game. But, but it's, it's, it moves you, like, emotionally. Yeah, and it's, like, also, like, I'd put this in the hands of pretty much anyone willing to hold a controller. And they'll, they'll, like, and they'll it. like it. they'll like it. They'll have fun. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's kind of lightning in the bottle. Mm-hmm. It's a lightning in the bottle game where somebody comes up with the idea and then probably no one will ever do it as well again. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't even know if I can see it. I don't know if a retitled Goose Game is yeah. really going to move <laughs> the needle next time. But uh, That flash in the pan was a good flash, though, for yeah. sure. Like, what happened? Maybe somebody boxes the goose up and sends him to America, and he has to, like, annoy people in, like, Ohio. That would be funny, actually. Because they'll shoot him. They will, and then they'll eat him for Thanksgiving or whatever. But I did have this, like, thing in my mind where there's a box, and there's this family in Ohio, and they open the box, and they (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It would be freaking funny. So I think that's a great pick, man. And, again, you're right. When you hear the word pleasant, this game springs to mind – the game that I picked probably does not, but I think I took the more literal approach of most pleasant surprise mm. and ignored the word, actually ignored the word pleasant. My pick is the Resident Evil 2 remake. And when I say pleasantly surprised, that's because my expectations for this like, were hey, not it was good. <laughs> it's like basically, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Not just, hey, it was good. Hey, it's really freaking good. Like, We've all been playing these remakes. They're yeah. hit or miss. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you don't really have a chance because the base game just isn't that great. 
But this, and also, like, there has been no shortage of Resident Evil remasters and remakes. Yeah. yeah. These games haven't been gone long enough to miss. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have a ton of faith that this was going to be awesome, and it just ex- yeah. it far exceeded my expectations on pretty much every front. Like, it was just great. Like, I couldn't... I, wow. Yep. Pleasant they surprise. And I'll say this, now that, you know, the RE3 remake is coming, like, now I'm all jacked up for that. Because if they give that much, as much tender loving care as they gave this, it's going to be yeah. great. Well, apparently it was going to be part of the same package. Yeah. Originally, yeah. they were going to, like, bu- like, bundle a, them together yeah. or something. Like, a couple years ago, they decided, like, no, nah, it's too That much. was smart. Cause yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think you can definitely sell Resident Evil 3 on its own. Absolutely. Yeah. So this was definitely my most pleasant surprise from this year. Um, and as I... I think before this even came out, RE2 is my favorite old school R- oh, Resident yeah. Evil game like, already. I'm, so that helps. So very few people would disagree with that. That helped, but still, my expectations were real freaking low. And I didn't think anything could get me to care about Resident Evil again. Right. But uh, yeah, I really like this. Yeah, it was great. So there you go. Also glad to show Resident Evil to some love in these awards. I feel like. Just this year in particular, it just so happened to be like the year of the great action adventure. And this game's just kind of... Although they do take too many shots to the head. Yeah. (laughs) Or maybe it's just my poor shooting. But, um, yeah, I just... I don't know. I'm just pleasantly surprised by this game. I'm excited for future remakes now. Although I think you kind of draw the line at RE3. Like, you don't really need to remake RE4, 5, or 6. No. I mean, I think... I would say go back and you could remake... uh, Code Veronica, maybe? Code... So that Veronica. needs a lot of work. Code Veronica would need a full revamp, yeah, uh, but it sure. would be an interesting challenge. I would also say go ahead and remake one and zero. Yeah, like get the get the early. You don't need to do anything for beyond, but like those early ones, like get them all up to kind of the same snuff as as uh, four. Yeah, and uh, sell that sucker as a package for the next. 15 years. Yeah. I just feel like this game's getting lost in the shuffle. There were so many good action adventures this year. Because it's a remake, I feel like it's being discounted. Yet, it still stands as the highest reviewed game of the year. So, there you go. Resident Evil 2 remake, most pleasant surprise. Up next, here's where we start getting into uh, some of the more nefarious awards. Hmm. The first one is most disappointing game. I almost... If we weren't short on time, I would almost just take a second to let people in the chat guess what both you and I picked, because I have a feeling they would get both of them right. Yeah. yeah. Or they'd think we were both picking the same game. That's possible, too. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, but So, Matt, what game did you end up going with? Well, I was actually going to pick the same thing you picked originally, but I figured you were definitely going to pick that. <laughs> okay. So I went with the other one, Okay. which is Anthem. All right. <laughs> uh, and to be fair, this is partly because of being reminded of the Fantasy League uh, last week. I'm like, yeah, that was a big letdown. Yeah. And with Anthem, like, <laughs> I still enjoy flying around and doing, like, I, I log into it periodically. Every once in a while, I probably like once a month and fly around and do some, like, free roam stuff and just, like, shoot some things and have fun, like, floating around in the in the Iron Man suit pretty much. Um, but I, my attitude towards this game is sort of on the level of, like, a disappointed parent. Like with Bioware, it's just like, like if like if your it's like your kid came home with a D, and you're like, I know you're capable of doing better than that. Yeah. Like it's, like I'm not even mad. Are I'm they just, even though at this point? I'm not so sure. Those yeah, they are. They yeah, can, they can't. I mean, I don't know what's holding this up. I mean, they were trying to branch out. They're trying to do something new. They were under the thumb of the like weird corporate stuff. They had to make a game as a service, hell or high water. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if Dragon Age Four is anything in like 2022 or whenever the hell that thing comes. And out. if it isn't, it's over. If it isn't, I don't know what to tell yeah. you. Yeah. But like this is just one of those things, and like I feel like they haven't addressed the shortcomings of this game properly since it came out. It's been almost a year. They and haven't they, given they still up. Though. They haven't given up, but they. I feel like they still don't quite know what to do. Yeah. And uh, that's a little concerning. Um, I've actually kind of been impressed that they have stuck with it. Because I think no one, no one would have begrudged them for giving. Well, up. here's the thing: I don't. I'm not impressed that they've stuck with it because I think Bioware would. I am impressed that EA has let them. Yeah. Continue to stick with. It. I thought EA would just. Let well, them, you know, it's like the third best-selling game of the year. Yeah, but I thought EA would basically let them finish out like probably the first year of their their you know development plan and like pull the plug. I mean, but that's a crazy seem, part. Doesn't seem like they're doing that. This is the third best-selling game so far of 2019. Yeah, I can't argue with that, I guess. So, I mean, we're probably getting a sequel at some point. I don't know if they give it to Bioware to make, but... Yeah, I don't know who you give this to. <laughs> like you, you go, You go make, get real chummy with Bungie. 
<laughs> Actually, yeah, that might be a, that might be a solution. Yeah, real chummy with Bungie. Destiny Three is like Anthem meets Destiny, and it's like you cross the universe is over. And I'll be, I've talked about that before, but that would be what I'd do. Yeah, I mean, this game was definitely kind of on my hot list, but I actually did yeah. enjoy the game a good bit. I didn't um, hate it. I just it, it wasn't it as can, good as I thought. It, or be way, it could have been way better, and yeah. I expect better storytelling out of Bioware by default, and it's just not there. GX Gear is saying Respawn should make uh, Anthem too. Mm, not a bad pick. I could, yeah, it's not bad. They're getting awful busy though. Let's let's let them keep stay on the Star Wars stuff. How about that? I'm cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a long time coming for good Star Wars games. Let's just let them do that for a little while. I'm cool with that. Uh, my most disappointing game. Everybody I already saw in the chat. They absolutely guessed it, and that is Shenmue Three. Um, I don't know how, if I. I don't want to berate the game again. I've done that enough. I feel like. Um, I think when I talk about it here in the awards, I want to explain why it was the most disappointing to me, and that's because I've been a Shenmue fan, like, all these years. Uh, I was a huge fan of the first game. I ended up playing the import of the second one. Like a lot of people, I was very excited when the, the when Part 3 was announced and the Kickstarter was launched and it was successful and it was being made. But I just, just being honest, it's just not a good game. And... Uh, I never expected it to turn out to be what it is. I know you did. Yeah, you- I did pretty much. My problem, as I've I've, I've labored to make clear, because uh, because uh, some people have a real problem with you not liking this thing. Yeah, they do. And I'm like, I don't like, I don't dislike it for the same reason Shane dislikes it. I dislike it because of the things they added that I don't like. If yeah. they had just, if they didn't have that stupid stamina system and had come up with a better fighting fighting system to replace the virtual fighter stuff, which they obviously can't use for rights reasons at this point. If it had just been like a super retro Shenmue retread, I would have been fine with it. Yeah. It would have been exactly what I thought it was going to be, but instead I am shoving apples down Rio's, ma- Rio's <laughs> gullet all day so he doesn't fall over like an idiot. So, see, see I would, that wouldn't have been good enough for me. Unfortunately, I did not get this on PC where there is a mod to remove the stamina system. Uh, um, so Even if they could are. remove the stamina system, I would still think this is a crummy game. If you remove the stamina system, I might... My, my, I might my opinion, it. Yeah, my opinion <laughs> of the game goes way up if you get rid yeah. of the stamina system. I might then like actually continue playing it if that was gone because pe- even though people are saying like it doesn't because it's not a problem later on that's not good enough yeah. for me well to the keep thing going. is it's not a problem later on because of and i got to that point i got to the point where it was trivial because you could just keep buying stuff and but but it's like then why is it there yeah it's just why, busy why work did it ever then. exist and a lot of the game is busy work like you should see how many fish they want you to catch later in the game it's ridiculous I but just, <laughs> yeah I, i've beaten on this game enough i'm not gonna flog flog it again um but it was a huge disappointment for me. Maybe. Well, I don't think you're maybe, ever. I don't think you're ever gonna have to deal with it again. I don't know. I'll say this. This may be the second most disappointing game of my entire life. With, well, actually third, because the first two are for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. <laughs> that was Pac Man and E. T. Mm. And this. Th- I mean, that this is that is literally. I never dreamed. That they would make the game as if it was made in like 1998. Like I just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, I told you that's what they were gonna do. It's crazy. Anyway, my most disappointing game in a landslide. In fact, my most disappointing game of the decade, which we did on the last game face, right there, <laughs> Shenmue Three. I could probably go back another decade as well, and it would still be my most disappointing game. Uh, next up. Biggest news story of 2019, man. This this one was not short of nominees. No, there are tons there were of big things, stories this year. Things. Picking the winner was almost impossible. I, my the mental gymnastics I was doing trying to rationalize one story over another. I, I finally came to a way to decide my pick. But what's yours? I went with the kind of ongoing loot box drama slash regulation debate. Okay. Um, just because I think that's it's been constantly present one way or the other. It uh, has. Yeah. It's you know it's continuing on from big news, a big story that's been going on for years now, um, and it's most interesting to me because. Um, I think it's the biggest in part because there was actual movement on this one in in terms of like what we're seeing in games. Yeah, like and stuff the, has it's, happened. And it's interesting to me because as I always thought, outside of a couple of countries with very strict game gambling regulations, it is not being classified as gambling. Yeah. But as I suspected, to avoid being put under the thumb of those kinds of regulatory you know spotlights, 
the game publishers are moving away from that model. Some of them are. For the most part, they're moving away. Not the mobile games, obviously, yeah. but like the big console games you already pay full price for. They're moving away from that. We Call of Duty DLC free yeah. this Call year. Call of Duty's moving away from it. Yeah. EA's moving away from it. Yeah. Um, they're basically, yeah, basically they're, they got scared. Yeah, the, 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 they don't want the, the government to come in and regulate. <laughs> they want to regulate it themselves. And that's kind of like what happens there is like, you know, you can't really call, you can't change gambling rules really to make loot boxes count as gambling without causing a whole bunch of other things to be gambling that also aren't gambling. But what you can do is make a kind of ethical argument, and I think the House touched on this a little bit in a terrible bill that needed to be rewritten about five other ways if it went further. But the direction they seem to be going is the idea that, well, if you do put it in here, even if it's not officially gambling, we're still going to have the Gambling Commission look at it, and you'll be, you're kind of going to be putting your game under the auspices of that, and that is the most effective way to get the publishers to run the other direction. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I think it, I think it is, has been effective to some degree. I think it's, it, you didn't need to outlaw loot boxes. You didn't need to declare them gambling. All you needed to do was scare EA and, and some of the other big publishers, and it seems like that has been effective. So I would say it's a big story, not just because it was like stuff that was reaching the level of like, you know, parliaments around the world, but because it actually had an effect on this phenomenon in the game industry. And I think we are seeing the downhill of it now. Vincent brings up a good point in chat. He's he he mentions, I don't know if you saw this news story or not, but the KD tracker. Yeah. Yeah. So in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, while you're playing the game, and this has never happened in a Call of Duty before. If you check the score while you're playing, it will not show you how many times you've been mm-hmm. killed. It only shows you how many kills you have and your score. I noticed that when I was that brief time I was playing it, I thought that was weird. Yeah, it's really freaking weird. And you only get to see your actual KD, your kill death average after the match is over. Mm-hmm. And so this week is discovered that so there's these accessories you can get in the game. You can get a watch. I only have one. I play I've played the game for the multiplayer, probably for 25 hours, I've only earned one watch. Mm. I have one charm on my gun. They're selling all this stuff. And the one of the watches that they're selling is a watch that will show you how many deaths you have. <laughs> so you're saying, like, they're changing, they're going away. They are. They're just finding other sneaky ways to make money. Is not, ba- is it's what's not happening. gambling. It's you true. Know, you know what you're buying. It's true. That's all you they're, wanted. At the expense of the people who paid sixty bucks for the game and can't see their KD. Yeah, well, that's just that's just Activision going to be Activision. That's so dirty, man. It's crazy. You would rather pay for maps? <laughs> no, no. I don't want to pay for anything. I want to pay sixty bucks for a game and play it. That's but that's yeah. not the way it works anymore. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Okay, my pick for the best news story of twenty nineteen is Blizzard in China. And, again, I waffled back and forth on this category literally all day yesterday trying to figure out which one to choose. And the reason I settled on this was because, kind of like your pick, it transcends video games. It's not just about gaming. Mm -hmm. It goes out into these cultural tentacles that have an effect on all these other parts of our society. Um, I mean, in this case, we're talking about, like, freedom and democracy Somehow video games got twisted all up in that, and that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you get Blizzard mixed up in it, and we see – I think another reason this is a big news story for me is because I feel like it finally pulled the veil off of a lot of gamers' eyes. Because Mm -hmm. we sit here a lot of times, we're like, these people aren't your friends. These publishers aren't your friends. They want all your money. They'll do whatever they can to get every dollar out of your wallet. Including ignoring human rights violations in the name of future profits to be had. Yep. And I feel like we say this, and look, a lot of our viewers are younger, and and I feel like when you're younger, you're impressionable, and you do kind of have this idealistic thought. And I don't want to say we're like old, jaded, angry guys or whatever. Also, if you're younger than us, you're like 35. Right, It's not like you're fresh off the the spring chicken boat or something. But the truth is, like, we've been around the block. And when you do that, you learn stuff. And, like, when we tell you that these publishers don't care about you and they're not your friends, it's freaking true. But it's hard to provide empirical evidence of that to people. And finally, there it is. And not only was it a video game publisher showing fans that, yeah, we're, we're not who you thought we were. It was also the one of the worst possible studios that could do it, mm-hmm. Blizzard, because Blizzard has BlizzCon. And Blizzard has the rep. 
Right. Like, those dudes never never really seriously screwed up before. No. And not only that, I mean, this was a serious screw up, but it was was something that they had been screwing up for a decade. It wasn't just this decision that they made. They made the decision a long time ago to get in bed with China Mm. and make that market a priority such in such a way that it would affect their cultural relationships with their users and the players. Um, So I feel like this is the first time where the average Joe player is, can see what we've been talking about all this time, that it's not about any of that other stuff that you've romanticized in your mind and in your heart about these companies. They are there to make profit and that is it. And if they can placate you and make you feel like they actually care about you, they're winning. They'll get more money out of you that way. So to me, this was the biggest story on a number of levels, not the least of which is just that, you know, we should all stand up for Hong Kong and hope that ultimately they end up settled in a democracy in some way. So uh, just a big story that has that reaches out a bunch of different directions. And I, I just felt like that was the biggest one for 2019. But mm-hmm. I wouldn't begrudge somebody for picking that or yours or any of like five other stories this year because there was just tons Big news this year, just across the board from the beginning of the year until the end. Uh, Next up, worst game we played. So this is different than most disappointing. Mm -hmm. Disappointing plays into your expectations of the game before you play it. This is just, of all the games you played this year, what was the freaking worst one? And what was the worst game you played, Matt? Crackdown 3. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good choice. (laughs) <laughs> like, for all the, the vitriol I might have about the decisions on Shenmue 3, uh, this was the worst thing I played. Yeah. To the point that, like, I hit a... I was, it, it was so weird. It took a while for me to, like, admit to myself I wasn't having fun <laughs> playing it. Because I like the it, first one so much. And you're also, you look at it, you're like, this should be fun. Yeah, it should like, be. why is it this fun? <laughs> why am I not enjoying this? I mean, I can, I can enjoy a mindless open world game, like... Almost by default. Like I've played all the Just Causes. I've yeah. played some of the Saint Rose Saints Row games multiple times. I played Mad Max twice. Like I am no stranger to zoning out with an open world game with no redeeming value beyond like, oh, this gives me a lot of stuff I can do and not think about what I'm doing. I couldn't even do that with this game. Like I would hit points where I'm like, I don't know what to do next. I could fast travel over there. I'm just gonna turn it off. Like it, just, <laughs> like it was. It's not fun to play. It's not fun to shoot things. It's not fun to jump around. It's not like there's no there's no satisfaction anywhere in this. I didn't enjoy a moment playing this no. game. I knew I wasn't going to though, because I didn't even like the first Crackdown. I like the first Crackdown a lot. It was I, big at G4 back in the day. Second one I thought was a little disappointing. But again, also I, I went never I it. went back to play you know Crackdown when they made it backwards compatible like shortly but you know, a while before this came out. And uh, it didn't hold up. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not good. It, we we progressed a bit. It turns yeah. out. And I can see that just, it was that back when it came out, though. And this just. Well, I think it was pretty good back when it came out. It's just it does it hasn't held up. It's been surpassed, and the basic elements of the game are not interesting or fun or compelling enough to go back to later and stand on their own merit. And it's big hook. It was just, never existed. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it existed in videos and demos, but like that whole like cloud thing this game was supposed to have, yeah. it never materialized. So it was just sort of there, and uh, I went through most of it. I don't think I even finished it. It's Thank like, God for Game Pass. And uh, that was <laughs> so the end nobody of that. spent money on this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna fight you over uh, Crackdown Three. No, no, Crackdown 3 doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, defenders. <laughs> usually, usually at the end of the year, you see, it's like, oh, don't forget about this terrible game that I liked inexplicably, but I haven't seen anybody do that with Crackdown 3. Yeah. However, we have seen people do that with my pick. And again, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think no one's going to be surprised at this one, although they might. I think one thing we should say about this category is we're not saying this is the worst video game that came out in 2019. It's the worst one that we actually played. Mm -hmm. And we're in a position where we don't have to play a lot of bad games. Uh, I'm sure there's an associate editor over at GameSpot that would laugh at our picks for this because he's been playing the crap like I did when I was an associate editor at GameSpot Mm -hmm. back in, like, 2000. But it's the worst game that we played. And the worst game that I played in 2019 was, hands down, Shenmue 3. It's just... Again, I'm not going to go on the tirade again about how there are just countless objectionably said, 18 bad. 18 years ago, the <laughs> clock stopped. <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> it sure did. They, um, they didn't lie to you. Yeah. <laughs> there, are just, there are so many elements of this game that are just objectionably bad. It's not subjective. It's not an opinion. There are just parts of it that are bad and broken. 
Um, and it was the, easily the worst game that I played. I don't have to play games like this very often where there's awkward stuff in them and there's just stuff that just doesn't work or it's clunky or janky. Like, even indie you should, games. You should play more European stuff. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's where a lot of it comes from. Because even you indie Greed games. Falls? No, I haven't got to play it yet. You should try Greedfall. Okay. Um, I'm not saying this is, yeah. Is it is, as bad as Shenmue? No, 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 no. Okay. But it's like, imagine a Bioware game made kind of between Mass Effect 2 and Dragon Age 2. Oh. It's kind of like that. But it was made in 2019. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's about on the, that level. I have the code. I have not played it yet, though. It's just been sitting there. That Give was one try. of the games. It's, it's better than anything they've made since Mass Effect 3. Is it better okay. than, like, Technomancer? Yes, it is. It's I would better say than it's that better kind than of stuff? Okay. Um, and, again, I don't want to beat up on this game anymore. You guys know where I stand on it. But uh, it was lo- – I mean, I'm in a good place if that's the worst game I played this year. Mm-hmm. Let's just Did be honest. Did you play Crackdown 3? Oh, yeah. Hmm. I thought this was way worse. Crack, uh, at least Crackdown 3 it was uninspired and boring, but at least it wasn't just, like, broken and janky. Yeah, it depended where you were in the city. Really. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both have good picks for this category. I don't think anyone's going to fight either one of us. Over, well, a few people, I think, might, I think the, a few I think, people might want to fight I me over I think the Shimmer. comments are going to fight you on this one. <laughs> I, don't, I don't expect to get a lot of heat on Crackdown. Well, they don't even know what I've played, though. So how would they know they, if it well, was the worst Well, they know you played Crackdown played. 3. Oh. This, to me, this game's way worse than Crackdown 3. Way worse. Way less interesting. At least there's some action in Crackdown 3. Uh, but anyway, there you go. The worst game I played in 2019 is Shenmue 3. And again, if I'm in that position, I'm pretty freaking lucky because there are associate editors playing way worse games all around the globe. Uh, next up, the game we didn't get. This is a fun category. This is where – this is kind of – I guess if you want to break it down to, like, a sentence or two, it's basically game got a high review score. I think that's insane. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And what's your pick for that, Matt? Astral Chain. Astral Chain. Um, Not that I thought it was bad. I just don't understand why this got nines. That is extreme. It's like it's just another platinum game, and it's not even very compelling as a platinum game. It's more, like, impressive that it looks as good as it does on the Switch. But I found very little to keep me playing in it, and it just seemed kind of like I'd rather just play Bayonetta if mm. I'm going to play like a platinum style thing. Uh, and like it doesn't do the combat as well as Bayonetta does, and it doesn't do kind of the the open action world stuff as well as Near Autom- Automata does. Like it's got a couple good ideas, but like it's a seven out of ten to me, like maximum and. Like I'm not saying you can't like it, but I just I looked I, you just going back through the years stuff like you know I, w- I wasn't even thinking about picking this game for this category until like while I was doing the research for the list, I happened along the Metacritic for this again. I'm just like really like yeah. it was it's the score just is way too high. so high. Yeah, like I'd agree with that. It's it, so I, that's what I don't get about it is like why I mean I guess because Platinum's got the rep and the reviewers liked playing some action game on the Switch that was like competently put together. But it just didn't do anything for me. It felt like kind of a, it felt like kind of a stew. It felt like somebody took all the leftovers from Thanksgiving and threw them in a in a pot and made like platinum stew. Yeah, like this is what this. I don't know how much out. Nintendo paid Platinum to make this, but it probably wasn't worth it because it's no. not selling. It's is it? I, I haven't been paying attention. It hasn't really. really charted at all. So it just it didn't move my needle at all, and I just sometimes it just confuses me. This, <laughs> like people this might play, praise actually it so high. be one of those games you might want to go out and buy a physical copy of. Oh, because like one day Collectors, it'll be worth something. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. This, it's just I'm, weird I have, game. You know, it has that air about. Yeah, it. weird games that happen. So you know what? I, the one that bugs me that I didn't buy in time for that was Gravity Rush Remastered. Oh. No. Because yeah. I remember I saw that like the week before Gravity Rush 2 came out in the store. I was in my hand and I just didn't buy it. And like a week later, it was a hundred bucks. Yeah. I mean, it was. It was. It was. I mean, if you can find Astral things. Chain cheap during that first pressing, you might want to pick it up. It might be worth something someday. Yeah. Just don't that's open. Probably not true. It's <laughs> probably not wrong. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I would. I would say that's that's a pretty good likelihood. Uh, the game I didn't get. Again, you guys can probably all guess this. It's Death Stranding. Um, not that even it scored all that high. It. it Score pretty high. I mean, score pretty high for what it is. That's yeah, I think what confuses me. Anyone the most, else making this game would have gotten sixes. That's what I was getting at. That's what confuses me the most is that it is a game comprised entirely of a quest type that everybody hates. Right. So if you made an RPG 
that every quest in the RPG was a fetch quest, what kind of score do you think that RPG would get? About a six. Yeah. And Maybe a seven if it's this pretty. Right. Yeah. And that's where I'm at with Destro. I mean, it's it's just, yeah. <laughs> that's all you're doing. Yep. The connectivity is what sets it off yeah. and sets it apart. But the rest of the game is just like, it's an RPG with one quest <laughs> quest type. Um, so I don't get why people are so enamored with this game. I don't, I'm not going to disrespect them for liking it or say that they're wrong for liking it. Just from my personal perspective, if you kind of compare this game to every other game that comes out, it got a pretty easy ride. Yeah. Um, and so I wouldn't say I don't completely get it because I do get the connectivity stuff and it's really cool and I enjoy that part of it. But unfortunately, that's not all there is to the game. The bulk of the game is just delivering stuff in fetch quests. So, uh, yeah, it's hard for me to understand where some of the scores came from, uh, where some of the fans are coming from on this game. Some people are saying, like, it's a, it's a relaxing thing. Like, they just kind of... They like playing a game for once where they don't feel like they're pressured and they can just kind of take their own time. I get that, and I totally respect that. Um, but otherwise, to me, it's just very repetitive. Doesn't feature a whole lot of depth. Cool connectivity, but that's not worth 60 bucks to me. Also, BB is not cute. It's creepy. Yeah. yeah. Like, I keep seeing, like, what's the cutest character of the year? Is it BD or Baby Yoda or BB? I'm like, BB ain't cute. No. BB's like some kind of monster in a bottle. It is. Like, it's not, it's <laughs> not a, I don't know what the hell you think is cute about that. Yep, and there's Norman Reedus. Yep, in his scarf and his sunglasses and his bridges cap. <laughs> okay, next up. Now we're moving into the awards where we have a runner-up and a winner. And there are only there's only a few of those. There's one, two, just three awards left in our Game of the Year 2019. And the timing's working out good, I think. Yep, Okay. Our next award, and again, we have runners-up for this and a winner, is Best Graphics. Um, and again, there's no rules for this. You know, it could be just based purely on art. It could be placed based purely on, oh, my God, like the shaders and the ray tracing and the technical side mm -hmm. of visuals. It's whatever you want. And, Matt, what's your runner-up for Best Graphics of 2019? Uh, my runner-up is Luigi's Mansion 3. Well deserved. Um, which uh, just, I think, nails the real-time cartoon aesthetic better than anything else I've ever seen. Yep. Like, this could be... You could air this as, a, as like, a, a cartoon series on Netflix with the exact same visuals, and I think you'd be fine. Like, you wouldn't have to change a thing. Yep. And the this, this game will never age. No, the detail's crazy. You can see the stitching in his gloves in the close-ups. You can, Yeah, it's just... It's... A, it's it's phenomenal work. Like the detail and the animation, the personality and animation is second to pretty much none. Like it's it's some of the best animation Nintendo's ever done. Yeah. And that is and it didn't even uh, do that it. is saying something. <laughs> it's like, yeah. This is like a second party game. Yeah. It's it's phenomenally good. I don't think you can see EAD was working with. Next yeah. Level. There's been a lot. There was a lot of support here. Yeah. But I don't think I don't think the Mario characters have ever looked better than this. No. No way. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's the best looking Mario game ever. But it's like, look at look at the stitching on the L. Look oh, how yeah. you can you can see the individual threads that make yeah. up the L on his hat. It and, gets it more impressive yeah. than when you actually get inside, and, it's, uh, yeah, and the and, stuff starts going all over. And the that's place. one reason it's so good is because like they have confined spaces and they can yeah. really focus the power on, on this thing. You can even see here, like the 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 world they're in here is not especially detailed until they get to the hotel. Yep. But uh, I was switch can only do so much. Yeah, but I was really blown away by how good this looked uh, by any standard, not just the switch standard. Yep, that's a good point, actually. Uh, my runner-up for best graphics is Kingdom Hearts Three. Mm -hmm. um, I did not like Kingdom Hearts all that much. I didn't not really did like I. the prior Kingdom Hearts. But when I started thinking about back across the year of like moments of where. The, vi the graphics or the visuals of a game just impressed me or overwhelmed me. There was like four or five of them from Kingdom, Kingdom Hearts 3. Kingdom Hearts 3 has a lot of good moments. I think the Tangled World is amazing. The pirate stuff could be mistaken for live action. In oh, yeah. Places. Absolutely. Um, and then I start thinking about how they start. They use the visuals for gameplay elements, too. There's that one carousel that you come to that's filled with all those, like, b those balls. Mm -hmm. There's like a hundred like red and blue balls, like just and they they're like, dude, just run through them and have right. fun. Like I, games don't do that enough anymore. That is one thing about that Japanese developers still get 
that a lot of Western developers don't get is giving you that time to just play. And this game does it over and over and over again, where you're just presented with this situation and you're just like, how did they do that? Well, I don't care how they did it. I'm just glad that they did. Um, and there was just tons of moments like that in this game. My, my issue for why this did not win is because for every moment like that, there's a moment where the game looks like ass. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. Like, this game is, like, all, over, all over the, the place. It really is. And you can kind of tell that, like, it was built across a long period of time and different people had their fingers on the game at different times. But there are some moments in this game that, to me, represent the very best of video game graphics yeah. from 2019. If you're skeptical on this, look up on YouTube the Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. Yeah. It is it is astounding. It really is. Like, I, the first time I saw a clip of it, like, before the game came out, I didn't realize it was Kingdom Hearts yeah. until they showed Sora's foot. Yep. I was like, what? Like, so, yeah. The the art, the art graphics on this, you might, you're, it's, this is almost like an art design choice here. Yeah. But, like, the visuals in some of these worlds are astounding. The Tangled World and the Pirates of the Caribbean world are were very, very impressive. I mean, even just the character models for the Disney characters. Are, yeah. You know, they nail the look. The really emoting well. and everything is just amazing. Great work on that front, anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of the game in general, though. Uh, next up, Matt, your winner for the best graphics of 2019. My winner is Death Stranding. Wow. Um, I, I was kind of surprised to see that. I think this is a, uh, it's not a particularly interesting game from an art direction standpoint, but I think what he pulls, what they pull off here in terms of the visual fidelity, the animation, keeping everything running st- at a steady frame rate, like just the, 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 the verisimilitude, the attention to detail, the believability of the character models as real people, the complete lack of clipping through things and floating rocks in the open world and like, you know, shitty grass texture. There's none of that. There is, this is the cleanest, like least glitchy open world I've ever seen in a game. And the fact that they're pulling it out of the Horizon Zero Dawn engine, which had tons of shit like that, and some of the least impressive, like facial, acting of any of the open world games I've seen, they took that engine and did this with it, blows me away. Like, I'm not saying it's, like, the best looking game, because it's all gray and washed out and sort of bleh to look at, because of just the, the art style they've chosen, the, the, the tone, the, the physical color tone they've chosen, but nothing else graphically impressed me on a technical level like this game. Well, like, the, you say the attention to detail in this game, it's astounding. It's ridiculous. Like, I don't the overall look of the game doesn't impress me that mm-hmm. much because the open world is pretty empty. The colors really pop, yeah. though. Like, the green really pops in this game. Yeah, when they decide to pop some color in, it's there. But it's it's in these there. little scenes is where the game impresses mm-hmm. me. Like, when you're dealing with, like, the invisible, like, creatures that are walking around and, like, the footprints are going yeah. into the sand. And filled and with water. Filled with and then water, yeah. yeah. Like, that little stuff like that is really, really Just the, the the detail on, on his eye twitches. The yeah. detail on how his hair falls and the other the little characters longer hair how they fall the the it's it's crazy like it the is. detail of yeah. the detail of how how the the packages age from the time fall rain the detail of where the rain lands and how that looks like this i mean you can smell the weather in this game at times because yeah. of how good they made it look and uh i don't think that solves many of its shortcomings to me but i i was con- the one thing throughout this game no matter how tired i got of delivering people's goddamn mail <laughs> i was i was just stunned by how well crafted this was technically yeah. they, they, and, this, I, and i hope it translates into this a similar kind of jump for horizon 2 this was very similar to kingdom hearts 3 for me it has those moments like i was talking about that just like blow your doors off but then there's other times where the game doesn't look that great so mm-hmm. um my pick for the winner is actually your runner-up luigi's mansion 3 um to me it's hands down the best looking game of 2019 i don't think it's close i think as far as technically what they're squeezing out of the switch Art-wise, interact interactivity with the visuals, uh, the physics, and it, it's just amazing. It's like a technical marvel to me, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3. Um, it doesn't matter that it's on Switch. To me, it's better looking than any game on PlayStation 4 or Xbox One this year. There's probably some PC game, I think, that will probably top it if it's running on max settings. Um, but to me, this is the whole package. It squeezes pretty much the most it can out of the hardware that it's got. And it doesn't even matter because it looks so good that it doesn't really matter what hardware it's on. Uh, the animation, again, it's like Disney-level animation in real time. 
Uh, you were talking about attention to detail. This game has it. Just watch his hose when he runs around, the hose on the vacuum. Like, mm-hmm. everything has physics attached to it. Everything is animated. I don't even know if they're, like, hand animated. Like, I think that hose just has real physics tied to yeah, it. Yeah, I think the hose is, is actually being affected by gravity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the more you pay attention to stuff like that in this game, the more it blows your mind. Like, as you go into some of the more cluttered rooms and just sort of haphazardly just start using the vacuum mm-hmm. and you just watch what happens, it's insane that this game is I also recommend, on like, doing, like, a freeze frame, like, pausing or freeze framing when you can when you do things like slam the ghost and stuff, the attention to the squash and stretch animation in that oh, yeah. is crazy. And the ghost like, faces. Just like, things you wouldn't even see unless you literally froze the video. It. It's insane. But it's in there. The more I played this game, the more it blew my mind. It reminds me of actually of classic Disney. Like, yeah. I've, I've gone back on Disney Plus and watched all the, cla- the original yeah. Disney animated films in, in release order. And to be honest, like I thought of this game several times while watching them. Like clearly, yeah. ins- they're clearly inspired by that old style of just a crazy attention to detail. Where like where you're watching Snow White, and you're like, I can't believe someone actually just drew this. Yeah. Like this game is like that. Yeah, it's amazing. Really, a work of art. Bravo. Uh, okay, we're down to our last couple categories, and we need to be because we're running out of time. The most innovative game. This is my one of my favorite categories every year because I really love innovation and I l- try to reward innovation with everything I do in this industry, I'll be honest with you. It is a big driver for me. So this category is important. What's your runner-up for most innovative game, Matt? Runner-up is Sekiro. Uh, I kind of went over this already uh, when I gave it best action adventure in Future Legend, but I think the sword, you know, Melee combat, sword fighting is a very tricky business, uh, in, especially in games. Like It's hard to nail it. It's hard to do it well, um, especially if you decide to have clashing swords involved. Like If you want to just like make it feel good to hit somebody with a sword, like that's, that's not as hard as making it feel like you're fighting against someone with another blade. And Sekiro does it better than anyone has ever done it. Um, so that, like, I wouldn't say the rest of it is tremendously innovative. It's kind of a straightforward Souls-ish game, but... In terms of like how you interact combat-wise, it's unlike any of the things From did before it, and I think it does it better than anyone else ever has. Okay. My runner-up for most innovative is a game that Matt is not a fan of, uh, oh. Astral Chain. And he said earlier that you didn't click with the combat. I can understand that, but that is also kind of the most innovative part of the game because... You're controlling two characters at once, mm-hmm. and they have created a system where you create you have two characters at once that can do combos together, all joined by the chain. Yeah, I'm wrapping the people up with the chain. It's like that's the closest it got to being interesting to me. But you can also use it like a clothesline. Yeah. As you go farther into the game, you can really start working that stuff. And it is a little bit like uh, rubbing your belly and tapping your head at the same time. It takes a while. It's almost like... Um, when you learn to drum and being able to play with your feet and your hands at the same time, there's this moment where your brain kind of breaks through to the other side and you can start like getting good with manipulating both characters. There was mm-hmm. also an element similar to this in Devil May Cry this year. So it's weird that there are these like two Japanese games that both had this idea of control two characters at one time, but Astral Chain does it the best by a mile. I agree with everything else you said about this game. It is forgettable on a lot of levels. But the combat in this game is pretty innovative. And coming from Platinum, that's saying something because that studio has been known for doing it and somehow it managed to do it again. Uh, I do agree, though. It's not especially intuitive. And that is kind of a chink in the armor as far as that's concerned. But at least Platinum is trying something new as far as combat is concerned. And you guys know me. I'm gameplay first, so I'm going to put emphasis on stuff like that. So for me, Astral Chain, my runner-up for most innovative. And now it's time for the winner. Matt, what is your winner for most innovative game of 2019? Uh, my winner is Disco Elysium. I want to hear your explanation for Which this. is um, maybe weird because a lot of it's just dialogue and written stuff, and it is very comparable to something like Planescape Torment, um, which is a 20-year-old game. Um, my argument would be that um, kind of twofold. First, uh, no one else really tries to do what Disco Elysium is doing. Um, I mean, it's funny that it's, it's innovative, because it's kind of an old style yeah. that nobody does anymore. Because it's building on something that came before it, but yeah. it came so far before it that most people that are going to play it weren't. Al- I haven't been alive long <laughs> enough know. to have played that game, except that a remaster came out this year. Oh, as is, you know, Planescape oh, right, came right, out right. Yeah, yeah. on modern consoles for you know a 20th anniversary celebration. A little late. A little late. Um, this even goes even further into the idea of Planescape because Planescape still does have combat. This has nothing like it's all done 
through dialogue and through stat rolling dice. There's no combat system in this. It's just pure dice rolling, stat driven dialogue choice. Um, and I got to give that a little bit of an award for innovation in part because like I don't value innovation quite on the same level you do. To me, execution is far more important than a new idea. Like if you can make a, an old idea and take an old idea and do it better than anyone else ever has, that is usually going to be more important to me than taking a new idea that I've never seen before um, because iteration is key. Um, maybe it's because I'm a Star Wars fan, and Star Wars is basically like taking all these incredibly old ideas, throwing them together in a different order, and saying, like, hey, look, <laughs> you never seen that before, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, um, and this is the best story-driven game of its kind, I think, since at least since Planescape, and it might be better than Planescape. Like, uh, certainly it's less clunky in terms of the fact that Planescape makes you play terrible D&D battles every once in a while, yeah. and this doesn't. This keeps it all kind of on the same level. Um, so I decided, you know, in a, in a year that I really don't think did, had a ton of innovation. Nope, <laughs> there wasn't. Um, this was a hard category. I, f I kind of went with innovation in a certain def definition for this, but I also kind of used it as a like, kind of a bravery reward category. Okay. So. I hear you. Uh, my winner is, and this may shock some people, Ring Fit Adventure, the uh, exercise app for Switch. I did not enjoy the game all that much. Mm. Um I have been trying to find, because on my doctor's orders, I need to start exercising more. Um, I've been trying to find ways to exercise with video games because I like to play sports that occupy my mind while I exercise. And when you get to my age, you can't find people to play sports with at your age. So I'm trying to find alternatives. Uh, like I said, I messed around with Beat Saber earlier this year. That's pretty good. That gave me a pretty good workout. At least got my heart racing. This I found... More motivating than Beat Saber, easier to exercise, but I also found that my sessions were shorter with this game because it actually, like, made me tired. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it makes you run in place, like, the yeah. whole time. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's good. I mean, I, I feel like this is a big first step towards real video game fitness solutions, not Wii Fit and all that other crap where they sold a balance board. Like, this is the progenitor of what's to come with fitness video games, mm -hmm. and... I just felt like even though I didn't enjoy it a lot and the execution was flawed in a lot of ways, to me, this is something that's going to be copied going forward. I wouldn't even be surprised if next year there's another game like this that uses the same peripheral that Nintendo's released. Mm. So also the peripheral's cool and different, and to me it was just the one thing that stood out this year that really was different from everything yeah, else. It didn't make that much of an impression on me, but like I was impressed by the fact that it all worked yeah. the way they said it would work. And like really well. Yeah. Like that band, like it registers that stuff really. It's yeah. almost scary how well it works. So there you go. Most innovative 2019 from me, Ring Fit Adventure. All right, two categories left. One is most anticipated game of 2020, and one is game of the year. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, what's your runner-up for most anticipated? Runner-up is Ghosts of Su Ghost of Tsushima, um, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Nope. Um, it's Sucker Punch. It's Samurai. It's looks like it's going to be an open-world adventure action adventure game. Uh, it's pretty much everything I like all in one place. Yep. Um, and we and anticipation for this. There is frothing demand yeah. for this after the delays and all the time we've waited after seeing it for the first time. Like, yeah, I like totally this was get it. this was honestly almost the winner for me. Yeah, it came this it came that close to being my pick for the winner. Okay, uh, my runner up for most anticipated game of 2020 is The Last of Us Part Two. The other place, the, the other obvious pick. But yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's like this is us. Like mm -hmm. you know, you stray a little more towards that type of a game, and I like games like The Last of Us a little bit more. You like to shoot things. I like to hit things with a sharp. Yeah, stick. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> like. And then culminating with our, we match the same pick, and I think right. everybody's pick for the most anticipated game of 2020, yeah. which is Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk 2077. 2077. Just put it in my veins now, like. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> I mean, all, all like, I can. I, I really debated on the Ghost of Tsushima versus this, and in the end, I just kept reminding myself of how good those side quests are yeah, there's in no Witcher, way. Witcher 3 yeah. and how the woman that wrote most of those is the narrative director on this, and yeah. it's like I think this is gonna be narratively one of the most impressive things in a long time. Well, it's like every time I learn more about it, I love it even more. Like they did like the whole music thing at the Game Awards and Grimes, mm. I freaking love Grimes. She's yeah, making music. For the soundtrack seems yeah. really beyond what I thought they were going to do with it. And this. it's not like they're just licensing songs from these no, artists. No, they're making they're new... creating, like yeah. Grimes made a new track for the game. Like it's awesome. Like everything, again, it's breath, every time it's I see It's breathtaking. Every time I say. see <laughs> yeah. 
Every time I see something more about this game, I just want it more. It was a no-brainer for me for 2020. Four months. Yep. And here we go. Coming up. It's that time, people. It's time for Sifted to announce its game of the year for 2019. Um, again, we have a runner-up for this category as well. Drum roll, Matt. What's your runner-up for game of the year? Runner-up is Disco Elysium. Yeah, I. You had to, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, you would not. You would be doing what the Game Awards did. Right. <laughs> it had to be your game of the year. And uh, do we even really need to say anything more not about really. it at this point? I think G- people get G- it. game good, play game. Yep, <laughs> game good, buy game, play game. Yes. Yep. Uh, my runner-up for game of the year is Control. Which, it's a good song. I, I wish I could have found more opportunities to reward this game throughout uh, the game of the year. And look, I don't. When I'm picking, I don't do yeah. that. I don't like say, "Oh, I really want to reward this game, so I need to slide it into this category." When I'm done, I always look back and I'm like, "Oh." Yeah. For a lot of these categories, you should imagine control just bubbling beneath the surface. Right below. I mean, it yeah. all almost for most innovative. But the truth is, is that it actually borrows a lot of stuff from prior games, yeah. but does it really, really well. I almost put it in there instead of Sekiro because of my preference for iteration and execution. Because yeah. this takes a lot of forgotten ideas from things like PsyOps and Second Sight and finally capitalizes them in a modern game that refines it in a better way. And those two games are the reason it did not win for me. Because mm-hmm. those two games exist. If PsyOps didn't exist... This game would have absolutely been right. my most innovative game. So it's just a difference of perspective. It is that good, though, people. Like, I know it's not selling very well. So I know you yeah. people aren't convinced on this game. At the very least, you want to have this thing ready to go for when the Alan Wake DLC comes out right. next year. Yeah, yeah. Like the, I think the DLC Well, then by then this, it'll be like 10 bucks or whatever. Right. Well, I think the DLC on this is going to be really good. The base game is great. The base like, game's really good already. I don't know how much more. I don't know why people just don't believe us when we say how good it is it just it's not selling no one's interested in it i mean it. i didn't care about it until the day i played it yeah i, it was, don't, know it, I don't know why i don't know why even the, the ads the trailers didn't sell me on it i did but as soon as i played it i was like oh wait it's the, okay and like as soon as i got my first like powers i was in it's that good people we're yeah. not lying to you we have no reason to lie about this game go buy it maybe wait uh with use your uh gift cards you get for christmas and wait till after christmas you'll probably get it on yeah. a discount because uh, my guess is you're going to get tons of other games and you can hold on until January to play this one. Yeah. Okay. It's time for our games of the year for 2019. No more runners up. This is the winner. Matt, what is your game of the year? Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Yeah. Did, now, I have Not a, que- a shocker, I have a, really. I have a question for you, actually. Mm-hmm. Had you decided that this was your game of the year before you watched the Game Awards? Or did the no. Game Awards help convince you? Game Awards had no effect on me. Okay. Um, I was glad to see it get some love. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that's because the only thing everybody could agree on <laughs> uh, out of that 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 lineup. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure. I thought I thought Disco Elysium was probably my game of the year. Um, but I went. One of the things I like to do is all my top picks. I like to go back and play them again, like in the, that week between the last week's show and this yeah. week's show. And when I got back into Sekiro after had not playing it for like six months, like I remembered how snappy it was and how good it was. And also in comparison to Fallen Order, how much better that felt and like how I'd kind of forgotten. Like I'd given Fallen Order a little more slack because like Sekiro had faded in my memory and then playing playing Sekiro again, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, this is great. This <laughs> feels great. Yeah. Um, and in the end, like as much as I love Disco Elysium, um, Sekiro was just... It's just it comes down to that thing of like what is the thing you like the best or value the most in a game, and I mean it's Matt Kyle it's the video game. Yeah, it's, I mean <laughs> if you gave the, if you made that thing glow and put it's him done. in a Jedi robe, like it would. I don't know if anything would ever touch it ever again. <laughs> well, that brings me nicely to my pick for game of the year, uh, and my game of the year for 2019 is Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. I just have to say that I, I didn't see that coming. I waffled admit. on this. I, I mean, I literally changed the rundown three or four times. Like I even printed them one time, and then had to go and throw those away and reprint them whenever I added this. It's what I said at the beginning of this show, which is either you have a no-brainer winner this year or you're splitting hairs. And this was absolutely a case of splitting hairs. I can't even really say that I drastically liked. 
Fallen Order more than like four or five other games. It got to the point where I kind of I looked at it like I enjoy them all equally. But then I started looking at the different elements of each game and the uh, more specifically the weaknesses of each game, trying to find a weakness, trying to find a crack in the veneer. And this was the game I had the hardest time finding a major issue with. And look, I know you, because you're a big Souls fan or a From Software fan, the snappiness of the combat was probably a little bit bigger of an issue for you. Mm-hmm. Really, um, the biggest problem is that it came out in the same year as Sekiro. Yeah. Like I love this game. Like I love everything about it. I love the story. Yeah. I love all the characters in it. I love the level design. Technically, it's stunning. Um, the voice acting, the music, BD1. Like I just, this was the game I could not find a major gripe with. Um, and so it is my game of the year for 2019. So there you go. That's it. That's it, the Game of the Year Awards for 2019. We do have one more fun award to give before we go, uh, and I'm just going to announce it, and then we'll run the winner underneath while I kind of say goodbye. Um, and we our pick for Trailer of the Year is the Overwatch 2 debut cinematic. Mm-hmm. Um, that This was a hard category that I had to spend a lot of time on to try to find. Did a lot of... Uh, Putting sifted through its paces, trying to find the best trailer from the last uh, the last twelve months. But that is our pick for trailer of the year. And while Jared plays that, we're going to bid you guys adieu for 2019. It has been an amazing year. Thanks to all you guys who have been on the chat. You guys make the show better. Let's just be honest. Like there are comments. You guys, if we we can't remember something, you guys are filling us in right away, and that makes the show better for all the people who watch or listen to the archive. So to me, all the people who watch us on Twitch, they are a part of the show and in making the show better. So thank you. Thank you for all the Twitch Prime that you guys have pledged this year. Um, Thank you for our subscribers who are still on our old Sifted plan. Thank you for our patrons who have been so gracious this year. I just can't thank you guys enough. You've been an an amazing audience, amazing patrons. It's been a great year. We got back in our studio this year, finally got Mm -hmm. off Matt's couch. I'm sure he's like, thank God for that. Um, It's been a great year, but I'm telling you right now, 2020 is going to be bigger and better for Sifted. We have some big stuff coming, people, uh, so stay tuned. Um, quick updates. I picked the winners of the loot boxes. We have the six winners. I'm cutting the video together now. That, that'll that probably be up tonight. Uh, so watch your inboxes on Patreon. And because if I'm only going to have like two days to ship this stuff out before I leave for the East Coast. So try to be on it. Try to keep uh, an eye on your Patreon inbox in case you're one of the winners. But we do have the six winners drawn I just have to put the video together and and upload it for you guys to see it. We have tons of content coming out. While I'm going to be gone and not in L.A. for the next 10 days, we have two episodes of Ask Shane Anything coming while I'm gone. We have two episodes of Pactor Factor coming while I'm gone, which are special episodes, I should add, uh, complete with wardrobe even. Hmm. Um, we have the top 10 games of 2019, a Civic Countdown coming, and we have Dossier for January. All that's coming while I'm gone over the next, like, eight or nine days. So I've been busting my butt to get all this stuff done. I'm not done with it yet. i still got two more days of grinding before I leave. But we wanted to make sure that we had something for you guys while we're gone. Uh, During the next, like, week, week and a half, curation will be slower on Sifted. Um, There's just not as much happening. Kind of after this Friday is when it just goes dead. Um, But there'll be some updates. uh, But more more importantly, we'll have a bunch of original content for you guys while I'm gone. So, Matt... Thank you, man. Sure. For everything. You're welcome. Letting us camp at your house for the first <laughs> few months of the year. Just being a great host. Yeah, what else was I using it for? <laughs> Jared. Look, we got new TriCaster TDs this year. Jared. Yep. We'll pull the window aside so they can see you, Jared. So they know that you're just not some dude in, like, the shower. Where is he? There he is. There's Jared, our TriCaster TD. <laughs> Thank you for everything this year, Jared. You've been amazing. You've been great. Um yeah, it's just been an awesome year. Thank you guys for everything. Without you guys, none of this would be available. We would still be sitting on Matt's couch right now. Um, so thanks uh, from the very bottom of my heart. I hope you guys have an amazing holiday season. Whatever you celebrate is great. Hope you have a great New Year's, a safe New Year's. As I always say, take an Uber, take a cab, don't drink and drive. 
Uh, but much love for you guys. I hope you guys all have a great holiday season. We'll see you in the new year.